I'd like to bring to order the March 28, 2022 Board of Supervisors meeting for Powhatan County. If Mr. McClung will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and Mr. Williams would do the invocation, I'd be grateful. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another wonderful day in Powhatan County and all the many blessings we enjoy. Amen. Amen. We have any requests to postpone agenda items, additions, deletions, or changes in the order of presentation? Motion for approval. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Smither, County Administrator updates. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'd like to celebrate this month is coming up. April 22nd is Earth Day. And we have a proclamation from the Board of Supervisors in honor of Earth Day. Uh, and I'd like to read that. I guess we have some visitors here from, uh, from Anti Litter. Uh, would they like to join us? Thank Come you. On Come on up. Whereas Powhatan County is a vibrant rural community that protects, preserves, and encourages the responsible use of its natural resources to ensure a strong sense of place where residents enjoy open space, farming, and superior <laughs> outdoor recreational opportunities. And whereas Powhatan County and its residents take pride in our actions to protect the natural beauty of our county through responsible stewardship, a strong anti-litter program, an annual clean business award, and protection of riparian areas. And whereas it is realized that Powhatan County civic and business groups and our citizenry must be more aggressive in its addressing environmental and quality of life issues. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors does hereby recognize April 22nd, 2022 as Earth Day and urges all citizens to join the Powhatan County Earth Day celebration on Friday, April 22nd <coughs> at the Courthouse Green in the village of Powhatan from 4 o'clock till 6 o'clock p.m. Be it further proclaimed that the Powhatan Board of Supervisors commends the hard work and the dedication of the local Earth Day Coalition comprised of the Powhatan County Anti-Litter Council, Powhatan County Virginia Cooperative Extension, Powhatan County Administration, Powhatan County Public Schools, Powhatan County Monacan Soil and, and Water Conservation District, and the Chamber of Commerce. Be it further proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors requested county departments and citizens join these organizations and recognize the importance of healthy environment and committing to taking positive and visible measures to protect and improve our environment and in helping to educate others to the same. Be it further proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors commits to support programs that further improve the lives of Powhatan County citizens and the natural environment in which we live and work. This is adopted by the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors on March 28th, signed by Ned Smith, the clerk, and Mike Byerly, chair. Uh, I'd like to say a few words. That, uh, thank you. I'm Betty McCracken. I'm the chair of the group. That's a loose, <laughs> a, a loose affiliation there. But I'd like to invite everybody to come. It's going to be a, it's going to be a very simple uh, celebration this year, and we're going to start back from COVID kind of softly. So we invite you to come. Thank you, Ms. McCracken. Thank you. Can I say one? Yes, thing? please. My name is Kathy Howland, and Gay and I are representing the Anti Litter Council, and we wanted to give each of you a clean, non use grabber. <laughs> so if you want to pick up litter in your area of the woods, we would love to have you join us. These were um, actually part of a grant, a small grant that Goochland, Powhatan, and Henrico went in on together. So we have a hundred of these. So we're giving these to you all and the school board, and then some of the groups that pick up litter on a regular basis as well. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have public comment period. I'd like to uh, 
address some of you because there's such a large crowd here <clears throat> this evening that as we have many public hearings, um, and if you're wishing to speak on one of the topics during a public hearing, I would suggest to you that you speak during that time frame, not during the public comment period. Um, and if you don't have any questions, or if you have questions, there's agendas at the back of the room on the desk as to whether it's a topic that you want to speak on that's in one of the public hearings. The other thing that I'd like to uh, um, make you aware of is we are going to have an appeal on a solar facility this evening. And if you are here to speak on that appeal, you are very welcome uh, to say whatever you wanna say, but it is on an appeal. It's not whether the Board of Supervisors approves or denies a solar facility in Powhatan County. It's only an appeal due to a decision that was made by the Planning Commission uh, at their previous meeting. Um, so if you've got any questions about that, that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight, the appeal, not whether it's a, uh, a facility that we approve or don't approve. At that point, I'll now open up the public Mr. comment Mr. period Mr. for Chairman. anyone to come down and speak publicly. Mr. You have three minutes as an individual. You will have five minutes if you're representing a group. And I'd also like to let you know that people speaking before the board may not be vulgar, rude, or use profane language. The public may speak on any issue that is germane to the county business. The public comment period shall not include criticism of specific individuals or attacks on any person or group. No political campaigning or promoting of a business is permitted. The public comment period is now open. Mr. Chairman, please, before we get started. Could we make it clear that if you're interested in the solar appeal, this is your only chance to speak. There will be no public hearing period. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And Mr. Cox is 100% correct. If you want to speak on that, your public comment period is the only time that it is available. There is not a public hearing for an appeal on a decision made by the Planning Commission in Powhatan County. The floor is open to the public. I'm Terry Adcock, D District 5, 5719 Cartersville Road. I'm speaking on Belldale Solar. There's a vote tonight if this industrial project is in accordance with the 2021 comprehensive plan. I represent the 30 surrounding residents with signs in their yards and 107 other Powhatan residents that have signed petitions opposing this project. The surrounding residents came together as a community and has spent months researching and sending me information that supports why this industrial use doesn't belong in our rural community. The letter from planning to the adjacent residents states this parcel is designated as rural area and protected lands. On the comprehensive plan use map in the 2021 long range comprehensive plan. This industrial use does not belong on this parcel. There are 146 pages in the comprehensive plan and the applicant will focus on page 76 about solar and not the entire comprehensive plan. There are seven other pages in the comprehensive plan that address protected areas, rural conservation areas and historic preservation that I highlight and gave each of you members. Powhatan County Planning Board voted that this parcel was not in accordance with the 2021 comprehensive plan. We gave you a list of why they said that Belldale is not in accordance with the comprehensive plan. Powhatan has not had the major runoff problems that has been experienced in other counties around Powhatan. Also provided you with what happened in four other counties and when solar manufacturing plants were put on land with similar steep slope terrain as this parcel. The comprehensive plan says that steep slopes above 15% grade should be protected areas. Not just the parcel, but the 350 acres that will be solar panels have grades well above 15%. For planning board feedback, one of their reasons they said this was not in accordance with the comprehensive plan was that the solar would increase runoff a minimum of 15 to 30%. 
if you combine these grades, the disturbance from all the stump removal and increased runoff from the solar, you will be destroyed. Deep Creek, the 835 acres classified swamp on this parcel and the downhill wildlife corridor. What about the James River? We are less than a mile from the James River. We provided you each with a picture of the flooding on Deep Creek Friday two weeks ago. This has been occurring since best management practices were not practiced when the timber on the 1100 acres was cut all at once two years ago. Add the 15 to 30% additional runoff from the solar. What a disaster we have in our county. My supervisor for District 5, Karen Carmack's campaign theme was Powhatan worth preserving. This is she ba the bag she gave to all of us that helped with her election. My question to you is, is putting Belldale Solar Manufacturing Plant up against the wildlife corridor and on protected lands and on a rural conservation area with massive runoff potential preserving Powhatan in District 5? Thank you, Ms. Adcock. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Blake Cox. I'm with the Virginia Land and Liberty Coalition. Uh, we're a project of conservatives for clean energy, and we advocate for smart and responsible clean energy here in Virginia. Um, that's two words I like to focus on is smart and responsible clean energy. Um, after studying this project, reviewing, reviewing the application, going back, watching some planning commission meetings, board meetings, um, I think we have an excellent example of smart and responsible in the Belldale Solar Project. It has all of the qualities of a smart and responsible solar project, a great use of land, robust setbacks and buffers, preserving priority conservation land, protecting our wildlife and the environment, strong community input, and the respectful economic development opportunity it is for the county. If you remember from where this project started to where it is now is nothing short of remarkable. The land use cut by over two thirds, uh, setbacks and buffers doubled um, in increase and the property tax benefit by over 200%. All of this while still maintaining the viability of the project for a landowner. The effort on this project to involve and engage the community, the community and neighbors is nothing short of impressive and should be apl applauded. So please can continue to support property rights of landowners and allow them to use their land as they please, as long as the rights of others, of their neighbors are not being violated. So we urge you to move forward this appeal and Belleville Solar for the county to continue to be a leader in smart and responsible clean energy. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth Hatcher, 3617 Trenum Road, uh, Honorable Chairman and other members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I had a question and I spoke with the plan director about it, this requirement that uh, in this particular type of CUK on a solar energy facility that it was a vote required about whether the request was in compliance with the uh, comprehensive plan. And I looked up that code section that you pointed me to. I know it far be it from a regular citizen to be able to read a state code section of Virginia, but uh, I did read through it and there's no requirement in that section that uh, for a solar facility that the uh, planning commission will, you know, vote whether it's in compliance with the CEP or not. There are some statements in there as how it might be approved. And one of them is that uh, for such solar facilities to be advertised and approved and currently in a public hearing process can be with a rezoning special exception or other approval process. And now it's stated in the zoning, the process is a CUP for a solar facility in Powhatan County. And the only other requirement in there, it says that uh, a locality may have a vote as to whether they want to go by what the comprehensive plan calls for. So they can just have an up or down vote on it from the beginning, whether they want to go by what the comprehensive plan calls for. And if they want to say they ignore that, then they can, they can ignore it. But there's no requirement in there that they vote uh, well, it's in uh, compliance with the CUP. And of course, if they voted that it wasn't in compliance with the CUP, I mean, that would be a vote to not approve. Uh, the other element is, I don't know what your vote will be tonight. Uh, I hope you'll do, you know, maybe one of three things that you'll just vote to return it back to the planning commission, uh, that you would not vote 
oh, well, it's in compliance with the comprehensive plan, because if you did, that would terribly prejudice uh, any decision going forward. And in the event that y'all voted against it when it came back, that on an appeal process, I mean, if it if you voted it's in compliance with the comprehensive plan, I mean, you know, game over, no use to go any further on that. So, uh, and then some other things as far as the terms used, uh, that solar facility, uh, you say solar farm here in Powhatan, but nowhere in the state code of Virginia is solar farm used in terminology or any of the language. So you're talking about something here in Powhatan that isn't even addressed in the state code of Virginia as far as talking about the code requirement of solar facilities. Thank you, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Good evening, it's David Barron, 3492 Richards Run, Powhatan, Virginia, District 3. In regard to the solar farm, uh, you've had Ms. Adcock present like 107 people, 30 some people live around there. They don't want this in their backyard. First, somebody just a minute ago talk about clean, cheap energy. We'll see how well that's working out for California and Texas. That bad winter didn't do very good for them. California's gonna have rolling blackouts all the time. Solar farm is just a gimmick. Do what anybody says. We got plenty of coal, use that. As far as that land up there, I spent 20 years on that land hunting it, no, pretty much every inch of it. They're gonna do it, put it on the backside of the power line down towards Davis Creek, so nobody's gotta look at it. Better off, don't even do it. Now, something else I see that we don't have a public comment period on is about our personal property tax rate and our real estate tax rate. I presume y'all are voting on that tonight. Uh, what I hear is we're not gonna lower the tax rate. Everybody's setting up there, except for Mr. McClung's, he didn't run a couple of years ago. Now, he may run on it too, but I know the other four setting up there ran on cutting taxes. Well, if you ain't cutting taxes, you're not doing what you said you were gonna do. And people say, well, we, you know, we can't cut taxes. Excuse me, that's bull. Well, I understand we're advertising for assistant county administrator, up to $150,000 a year. If that's the case, let me know where I can apply for it and when my interview is. And that is a question, Mr. Barley, a question. So please, as I put in writing last month, when I ask a question, I do expect an answer. If you can't give me an answer or you don't want to give me an answer, just send that to me in three days. I don't think that's asking too much. Yes, there is an answer. No, I don't want to give you an answer or I don't care. Any of the three is just fine. And we got to have an assistant county administrator, we got a problem. This county is not that big. You know, we spend money like a bunch of drunken sailors. We got a president up in the White House right now who's running this country in the ground with inflation. And I'm sorry if I'm picking on somebody, criticizing somebody, but those are facts. And we're gonna go out here and keep hiring people and hiring people. We've lost our mind. Y'all were elected to run this county. Y'all are the bosses, not a county administrator. If that's the case, we'll vote for the county administrator. We don't. So please consider what you're doing before you go out here and throw away our tax money. School system, 60% of the budget. I know y'all can't tell the school system how to spend the money. But here again, we got a superintendent, a couple of assistant superintendents, a principal, two assistant principals. We got more administration than any county around. And it's pathetic. So please think before y'all do these things tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Robin Duncan. I live at 5809 Anderson Highway, but I own a parcel on 5490 Cartersville Road, which is very near the project. I totally agree. Drew Price has done a great job doing everything he can to make as much as what their knowledge is right now for how to prevent erosion and have great effects. I mostly wanted to say, and I know the vote is a little different. It's not like you're voting on this tonight. Uh, you're, you're voting, you know, but I just want to bring up another issue. And it has to do with antibiotics and multi-drug resistance. 
I um, have worked at, at an acute care nurse practitioner at St. Mary's Hospital a few years back. We have cards that are laminated in the office and those cards guide us in what we're treating infection wise, whether it's community acquired uh, pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, infection for a wound, whatever. Those cards that are laminated there for us literally come from the soil. The soil in your region determines that. Um, I know we're doing everything that we say we can do for the erosion, but even the erosion will affect that because bacteria that lived in the soil, literally that's their home. And that's the, another reason they tell you to eat locally. It's not just to support your local community. It's to keep down your multi-drug resistant bacteria because the bacteria growing there that has resistance to say vancomycin, something runs down the road and washes in, it can then breed that resistance to another bacteria that doesn't have it. So I think there's a lot more, we can always add a solar farm. We, all, we only have, we have three already. So if we wanna do one later, and I know he's done a lot of work, sure. Um, but I think we need to consider this more carefully because there are things that we don't even think about that are gonna be affected. Um, I think that's all, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For a comment that's outside of the presentation later. This is just my public comment. Is that yes, okay? Just a couple of comments. Okay. It's not about the land use. <laughs> um, my name is Jane Lloyd. I live at 36 Hatcher Road. Um, I'd like to share just a few statements from the same person. Um, when asked what type of programming she would enjoy being offered, she said, I go to lifelong learning in Chesterfield and have enjoyed and laughed so much through participation in many various classes or in the daily virtual lounge made available while lifelong learning had their physical space shut down. I'd like to see something in Powhatan. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have technology training offered for new phones or iPads or laptops? And in an email provided to the board when we presented in August of 2020, she said, seniors like to visit and talk, play cards, do puzzles, read, discuss and exchange books, eat and exchange recipes learn through interesting lectures on countless topics, paint and draw, learn a foreign language and exercise. Board of Supervisors, if you could please find a place where we could come together daily, it would be so nice. I share these quotes tonight because it's Ramona Thompson who spoke these words. A strong, fit, active, vibrant, generous woman. Just over three months ago, an unexpected surprise diagnosis. She's now on hospice and unresponsive. She fought for this. She believed in it. She volunteered and she advocated. And when it happens, she won't be able to enjoy it. I saw Ramona yesterday and spent time with her and promised her that she'd be part of this discussion tonight. This is not a low income need. This isn't a transportation need. This is a need for challenging activities, socialization, learning and engagement felt by countless indiv individuals that I hear from who happen to just be closer to the end of their death than the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Cordelia Davis, and I'm 1605 Cook Road in Powhatan. Lived in Powhatan all of my 70 plus years. Love Powhatan. And I'm here to speak on behalf of a standalone senior center. We have visited Charlottesville, and they have a beautiful center. We don't want anything on that scale, but we would like to have something that we can go to as seniors. Uh, and a senior citizen, according to AAR, AARP, is anyone over 55 years or older. We have people, you see them at the drugstore, you see them at Walmart, you see them at places. 
and there are seniors who sit home and have nowhere to go. A building where we, right now we're at the rescue squad building, we're in one open space, but it would be nice to have a space where we, if you wanna come and do pickleball or you wanna come and play cards or you wanna come and exercise, do crafts, you have your own separate area. Right now, I think that if Powhatan have the money, have the land and Lord knows we have the need so I'm thinking, you know, why can't we have a standalone senior citizens? We all will benefit as each of us in here is getting older. If you look through here, I'm, I'm about 75% or more us 55 years and older. So then, you know, we just need so we can be together. We're not talking about low income. We talk about people everywhere, power tan. Power tan is more than one person. Power tan is all of us working together to make it better for all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Not seeing anyone else come down for the public comment period. Nope. There's one here. Good evening. My name is Barbara Brown. I live at 4550 Anderson Highway. And I own a farm like several of you. And several years ago, when I was thinking about what to do, and I, I was appointed to the Planning Commission, um, Mr. Cox said to me, it's all a process, and you learn through the process, and sometimes the pieces fit now, and sometimes they fit later. Does that sound like you? <laughs> so, um, and when it comes to the solar farm and looking at it, it has been a process, and we've had to go and sift through a lot of beliefs and then go find the facts. And one of the things that I, I'm a researcher, so I have looked at all those and I am comfortable. And some of this land comes down and flows into the drainage into my property that solar panels do not damage water. They are not dangerous to bees. They um, do not kill birds. So in fact, more birds fly into buildings and into solar panels. Um, I don't know about you, but I've collected at least five each year. Yeah, gruesome. Um, but one of the other things that I have learned is that there are areas in the country, notably Indiana, Minnesota, Arizona, that are using solar farms in, a, in an agricultural area. And they um, have under them pollinator plantings and they have beehives. The panels here are high enough that you can put beehives under them and do commercial beekeeping. They also are used for goats and for sheep. Goats represent the fourth most common um, agricultural animal in the community. The first being pullets. Um, about fourth is the um, horses, but they tend to be recreational and not really used for agriculture. So as an industrial use, it doesn't have to be. And maybe part of the process is a condition that enables the um, solar operator to put in or it requires them to put in some agricultural use since that is a wave of the future. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lindsay Ack. I live at 2813 Maidens Road. Um, Powhatan County has designated this parcel as a rural area and protected lands. Um, the description of protected lands in the comprehensive plan is perennial stream corridors, floodplains, wetlands, or, and or steep slopes over 15% of the grade. The part of the parcel where the solar panels have been proposed to be located um, has all of these features. Um, particularly the south side of the power line where four streams um, converge and run under proposed panels into major creeks that slope um, well above the 15%. Um, so it, it would seem that this is um, not in, um, in line with the, um, the rural designated areas and protected lands. So hoping that you um, vote against the solar. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Amy Wood, 5635 Cartersville Road. Excuse me, I just broke my glasses in the car, so this might be a little hard. Um, I did a little research too. I was trying to decide what does in accordance mean? I did not come up with an exact definition, but I did find from a neighboring county some conditions that a solar committee came up with for their CUPs for their solar projects. I'm gonna read as many of these as I can just to maybe give you a little bit of food of thought about is this in accordance with Powhatan County Comprehensive Plan. These are their different conditions that they have. They have a construction traffic management and mitigation plan, a construction traffic control plan, a construction mitigation plan, traffic, traffic safety requirements for employees, the construction and deconstruction hours are Monday through Friday, not Monday through Saturday. The vegetation is to be established and maintained throughout life of project. Noise reduction on adjacent property lines. County staff training for EMS if requested. Height maximum of the entire project. Approval of an erosion and sediment control and storm water plan with the surety plan posted with county prior to any land disturbance activity. For soil stabilization, the project is developed in stages. There is an on-site storm water management and erosion sediment control manager. The applicant will provide individuals responsible for performing daily inspections of storm water and erosion and sediment control. Practices and devices installed throughout construction. This individual will provide the county a weekly status report of project and any issues. The county may hire an independent engineer of its choice for weekly progress check that's to be paid by the applicant. The applicant must post a $500,000 bond to ensure compliance with CUP at time of the site plan approval letter. Bond may be released after six months of completion. There must also be no outstanding damage to downstream properties that is attributed to the project. Uh, two more to go. One is a project liaison. The applicant and operator shall designate at least one public liaison, publicize a toll-free phone number and email address for communications with liaison during construction and post it on temporary signs at each access. Information should appear on op operator website and county website. Will act as a point of contact between citizens and construction crews. Should be available in person and by phone during active construction hours and shall respond to any related questions of the facility or property within 24 hours. Shall begin at the pre-construction meeting. Monthly reports detailing complaints and resolutions provided to the county during construction and six months at, afterwards. The final condition that I've noted was a pile driving notice. Adjacent owners notified seven days prior to start of any pile driving activity. Just want y'all to think about those and if this is in accordance with our comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Not seeing anyone. Uh, Mr. Smither, anyone on Zoom? Yes, sir. Mr. Max Timberlake, uh, please uh, go ahead with your comments. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, board members. Um, my name is Max Timberlake, 1479 Dorset Road. I thought I had it unmuted. Mr. Timberlake, I can see you're, you're not on mute, but I don't hear you. Hmm. Huh. Let me try a different. Uh, you, now you're on mute. You. He's, you're on mute, Mr. Timberlake. Did I get unmuted yet? <laughs> yes, sir. There you go. Yes, sir. You're good to go. Oh, oh don't don't touch another button, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm Max Timberlake at 1479 Dorset Road. Today I'm representing Powhatan Farm Bureau Federation as president. I'm presenting my comments in writing in case I'm 
not able to attend the meeting in person. Although not directly related to issues on the agenda tonight, I need to address a serious problem that has concerned me for some time. That is the use of the term farm by the solar industry. The term farm has been stolen by the solar industry and has been used to their advantage because it sounds good. If you ask the common person, what is a farm? Most would describe a farm as livestock, crops, forest, vineyard, among many other agricultural operations. The only way to resolve this serious violation of definition is to remove any and all links between solar and farm in our county documents and our everyday conversations. Okay, on with the important issue of the agenda tonight. Board of Supervisors expected to rule if the CUP for Bildale Solar and Industrial Project on Carsville Road is in compliance with the Powhatan Comprehensive Plan. Our Farm Bureau Board believes the Bildale CUP is not in compliance. Let's review some background. This project was turned down once several years ago. Most importantly, the Powhatan Planning Commission has already turned down the CUP for the second time at the March 1st public hearing. There's been an influx of solar projects in the state of Virginia and here in Powhatan. <clears throat> because of this influx, many states and counties have struggled to develop rules and regulations and ordinances for these projects. Unfortunately, the big money continues to win. And many counties like Buckingham and Louisa have experienced the catastrophic effects of unacceptable regulations of solar. As a result, below are the official positions of Virginia Farm Bureau Federation regarding how solar affects the state's agriculture and forest community. From a policy standpoint, Virginia Farm Bureau is neither supports or opposes solar energy. <clears throat> I apologize, I'm taking a little bit longer here because I'm getting out of breath. Uh, we believe more studies should be done on the impact of this utility scale uh, energy has on agriculture. We support the utility scale solar facility being located on marginal lands. This section uh, of the gen this session of the Virginia General Assembly has passed legislation covering issues to protect Farm Bureau. Many le legislators across the state, including our own delegate, Delegate Ware, have worked on regulations. Back in Powhatan, the Powhatan Agricultural and Forestal District Advisory Committee and many private citizens have provided input to the comprehensive plan that uh, covers many of the same issues involved in natural resources. Again, Farm Bureau believes that more studies should be done on the impact of solar industry projects as this. Attached is a review of the Bill R. Solar CUP conducted by the Monacan Solar and Water District. This letter has identified a number of concerns, especially related to the proximity to Deep Creek. One of the many critical issues is the topology and the major drainage ditches that run into Deep Creek that is less than a mile from the James River. I believe most of the site for the, for the parcels will require the, the tree stumps to be removed. Imagine how much soil erosion will occur on the slopes when all these tree stumps are dug out. In conclusion, the comp plan has been, has been viewed in total and does require some careful judgment if this property is suited for the industrial project. It is not a farm. I ask the supervisors to stand up for the big money and vote no to the Bildale CUP compliance. I thank you for your time and your service power time because I am just a farmer, plain and simple. Thank you, sir. Anyone else, Mr. Smith? Uh, Zoom is clear, Mr. Chairman. Okay, great. 
We will close the public comment period. Moving on to the consent agenda. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Consent agenda passes. New business. Next, we have a presentation by Dr. Judy Kane Oliver with the Senior Action Committee. Ms. Oliver. I think this is ready to go. Let me first say that I am uh, representing the Senior Action Committee and I would like for the committee members to stand um, to be recognized. We have many of them here tonight as well as other people who are also supporting the efforts of the Senior Action Committee. What is the Senior Action Committee? It is a grassroots effort to bring attention to the needs of the aging population in our community. The purpose, to understand the needs of seniors in our community, to improve dissemination of information to seniors about programs, services, and resources. And just as a side note, I would say that today I got confirmation that I have a guest speaker from Massey Cancer Center coming to Powhatan or willing to speak with, with Powhatan uh, later this month but the dissemination of that information becomes very time intensive to be able to publicize that as uh, uh, due to the lack of structure that we have right now. Also to advocate for additional programs, services and resources, and to advocate for a permanent space for seniors to be able to gather, learn, interact and volunteer. Our mission statement is simply is an organization committed to planning, promoting, and supporting the healthy aging of seniors in the county. We endeavor to accomplish this by empowering and supporting seniors, developing and support facilitating programs, and expanding services to promote healthy living. Let me just add a few facts about Powhatan seniors currently. As you all probably know, According to the 2020 statistics, there are over 5,000 seniors living in Powhatan, comprising about 17% of our population, and that number is growing. Currently, we have multiple sources, just to name a few, churches, communities, organizations, social services that provide services, resources for the aging population. The problem is that there is little coordination of the services and resources which affects accessibility and puts a strain on the volunteers. More seniors use the local food bank than any other age group. And other areas similar to Powhatan have demonstrated a commitment to seniors by supporting a dedicated senior center. There are over 80, approximately 80 senior centers around Virginia right now. And many of those are in rural areas, uh, some even smaller areas than Powhatan. The action that we have uh, taken to date, and uh, let me just say that it was in September when I first came to say to you all who I was and that I had organized this and I would be back with a report. So since September, we have done a lot of engagement with community stakeholders, meeting with pastors, the YMCA, coalition of churches, civic organizations, the leader of the free clinic, et cetera. And that communication is still ongoing. We have also held two town hall meetings since December. We had a presence at the parade, and then we've had people collect, uh, fill out surveys. To date, we've had 199 surveys completed, and 97% of the respondents support the senior center. The top three types of programs desired of a senior center, social activities, recreational activities, and information, including learning. So what is a senior center? Our vision of a senior center is a standalone building that can serve as an information center for community-based resources for center seniors, as well as a place that provides opportunities for socialization, lifelong learning, and intergenerational interaction and engagement. While this space 
would be dedicated to seniors, it would allow for community involvement from all age groups. And let me say that the kind of senior center that we envision would be the kind of center that in the morning you might have a class about good nutrition, uh, meal planning based on a budget, and in the evening you would have a class on gourmet um, cooking. So it would serve a range. Who are the people who benefit from a senior center? I'm not using real names, but these are real instances. Mary Jane, who moved from her, with her husband to Powhatan to be near her family, and her husband died soon after relocating. Mary Jane knows no one, and she wants socialization, and she's looking for a new purpose in her life. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who live on a limited income and are clients at the free clinic, while depending on the community food bank to get by. They need knowledge about services and resources. Mr. Smith, a company CEO who has worked out of town for 34 years, recently retired. Now he's looking for a new opportunity to give back, to volunteer, and again, find a new purpose. And then finally, the community at large through intergenerational activities and volunteerism. A few facts to consider. A disproportionate number of seniors live in rural areas. And this next one is particularly concerning to me. Older adults in rural areas enter nursing homes at higher rates, younger ages, and showing less impairment than their Metro counterparts. Research shows consistently that there are four main factors that, com that uh, contribute to healthy aging. And those are good nutrition, exercise, continued learning and socialization. None of those four things are cost prohibitive. And according to the, US, to the national statistics, the US population is aging. By 2030, nearly 20% 20 of the population will be 65 years and older. And again, many of those people are, are relocating to rural areas. Our society and culture are very different today than they were 30 years ago. Families are no longer able to support people as they age like they once were. Our initial recommendations for supporting seniors is that we would ask that the board identify a dedicated space to support so, uh, social activities, recreation, learning, and educational activities. We also ask for the infrastructure to support these activities and for a director to lead the community efforts to grow and develop Powhatan Senior Center. And then I wanna leave you with the top 10 reasons for supporting a senior center. 10, social connectedness contributes significantly to an older person's mental and physical well-being. Nine, the aging population is increasing and as the numbers grow, the needs for resources and services also increases. Eight, senior citizens, senior centers help to bring, break down the barriers to accessibility and care. Seven, senior centers facilitate coordination of services currently available and facilitate communication. Six, senior centers are a cost-effective means to provide additional resources and programs. And I might say that I wouldn't mind being able to come to a senior center to, to learn more about uh, technology from a high school senior, nor would I mind going to a senior center to be able to provide tutoring or reading support to an elementary age child. Five, multi-generational programs can strengthen the community ties, improve interagency coordination, and stretch taxpayers' dollars. Four, seniors are the pillars of our community. As you all well know, seniors are the foundation of the food bank, Christmas mother, the clothes closet when it existed, the educational foundation, 4-H, and I could go on and on. The experience and wisdom of seniors benefit all of us. Because we age, we all have the ability to benefit from a senior center. 
And because we age, it does not diminish our purpose and relevance. And then finally, I will say that I've had the privilege, I work as a therapist and over 30 years, I've had the privilege in this community to meet with many wonderful seniors who are talented and informed. Life can change quickly, sometimes on a dime, due to the loss of job, health, mobility, family, and it can become, life can become like white water rapids. I believe that a senior center could help benefit a lot of people navigate those transitions. Finally, we look forward to hearing back from you with your decision about your interest and willingness to support a senior center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Board members, any comments, any questions? I have a comment. <clears throat> Thank you for coming out and sharing the knowledge that you've gained uh, from many seniors in this county, of which I qualify. Um, as you were giving the statistics, I thought it was quite interesting. One thing there, um, and, and many of you, I, I was at one of your town halls and, and spoke, and I think there's a way to work something out here. That's to answer. I, you don't need to wait for my position. My position is pretty clear. I think there's an opportunity there to take care of uh, some situations to help improve uh, our relationship with seniors and how to move forward. And as you were giving me some statistics, giving us all statistics, I was listening. We, we spend a lot of money in this county, as other people know and, and pay attention to. 58% uh, uh, goes to schools. Um, it's a little over $50 million of our budget. And the one thing that got me is I was sitting here listening to you say 5,000 seniors live in this county. There's about 4,300 students that go to this county. We need to provide the best education we can, but we also need to find a way to look out for our aging population. Um, 35 million for schools, it, it, it could go on and on and on. Uh, so I don't think your ask is being anything ridiculous in my mind. Um, I think there's probably a lot of questions that need to be answered moving forward but I do applaud you for coming out and sharing your information. And thank you to all of you who are in attendance tonight. Next on the uh, agenda, uh, resolution R-2022-09, uh, calendar year personal property tax. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. On page 38 of your board package, you'll see a list of tax rates proposed for the a personal property tax for 2023, uh, basically at $3.60 per 100 rate for personal property, business personal property and machinery and tools, and a, a measurable number for uh, veteran person, veterans personal property, volunteer fire personal property and handicapped modified vehicles. So that, uh, on page 38 of your agenda package, you'll see that list of uh, proposed rates. I move to approve resolution R-2022-09 as presented. I'll second. Any comments, questions? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Cox. Mr. Smither, why do, are we forced to list disabled veterans personal property and volunteer fire and rescue personal property? The, the, the rate is so, it's nothing. I mean, so why, why do we have that in? I think under the Dillon, under the Dillon rule that we're not allowed to to make it free, so but we can't allow to set a rate, so we okay. have set a rate that thank you makes it attractive. I like that transparency. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. aye. We need a roll, roll call. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yep. Roll call, Mr. Smither. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. Aye. Ms. Cox. Aye. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Byerly. Aye. Next up, resolving. Uh, R2022-10, calendar rate, real estate tax rate. Mr. Chairman. Would you like to make a motion, Mr. Cox? Yes, I would. 
I'd like to make a motion that we defer our 2022-10 until our regular April meeting to give the board an opportunity to explore a real estate tax decrease. So it's a motion to defer. Do you have a second? It doesn't need a second, but I'll second it. We need a roll call on that. Discussion. Discussion. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so why a deferral? One, inflation uh, is at a 40-year uh, high. It's impacting all of us. Uh, rapidly inflated home values. COVID and supply chain interruptions, Ukraine and China, and a commuter community which is adversely impacted by high gas prices. But probably more important, there are ample funds to have a two to three cents decrease in the tax rate. Holly, could you put up the one that says tax rate? And if you would pass those down, please. This is from the 2023 operating budget. And if we blow it up right in the middle, you see where the, yeah, where it says contingency fund under community development. This is operating budget funded by revenues from this year. We have a contingency fund, uh, which uh, has had no discussion, was not singled out by the county administrator, uh, but has an increase of 1 million $424,355 for some unexplained purpose. That will fund three cents. So the money is sitting there. <clears throat> we already have it in the budget. And I think we need to have a discussion about how to use this money and whether the tax decrease is in the best interest uh, of the community. So it's not about a decision. It's about we need more discussion, particularly when the money is sitting right there in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Sure, Ms. Tomek. I would like to, I don't, <laughs> last year, March 19th, 2021, we all agreed to a 79 cent tax rate. Um, somebody came down today and mentioned that uh, this board had assured the public we would have lower taxes. In a two-year time frame, we've lowered the tax rate nine pennies. Um, last year, Mr. Smither worked diligently for months doing different modeling to ensure we would not be caught off guard by any unforeseen circumstances. We spent months deliberating over various tax rate scenarios, um, and some of us mentioned that we were concerned that 79 cents was too low, in fact. Probably more importantly, we all agreed we wanted to take the political football off the table and set a rate that we can all agree upon and be comfortable with. Therefore, I am going to maintain, I am comfortable with the current tax rate of 79 cents for the following reasons. We wanted to be regionally competitive. 79 cents ensures that. We all agree fiscally well-run counties have a set tax rate. It doesn't get adjusted on a whim or for political gain. We agree a set tax rate provides stability. That's what we're going for kind of encounter to Mr. Cox's statements. We have an erratic stock market, inflation, a fluctuating economy, compression issues that we have all uh, said that we wanted to address, <clears throat> increased wages and hiring challenges. Playing fortune teller has not worked out well for us. Um, Mr. Cox, Mr. Williams and myself, two years ago, voted to keep the tax rate too high. We in fact could have lowered it. It's really our, fiduciary responsibility to go with the plan that we put in place last year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Williams. I agree with Mrs. Carmack's statements that yeah, last year we did agree that we wanted to bring the tax rate down and get it to a rate where we were all comfortable with. I never said the rate was 79 cents. 
Anybody wants to go back and check the record, they can. But any plan gets nuanced. Once you open the plan, like any business plan, things around you change and the plan has to change. And you've heard me say this before. You're the workforce for the Richmond region. Jobs aren't in Powhatan County. Well, as long as I can remember the history of Powhatan going back to the Old Testament, people have been going to Richmond and Racco, Chesterfield, to a lesser extent, Hanover, where the jobs are. Now, if you don't believe me, go out on race 60 in the morning and you'll see the tide go out. Crossovers don't work. And then in the evening, come back, we can set up some lawn chairs and we can watch the tide come back in. So right now, if you're looking at the gas prices and if you've lived long enough, like I have, again, like Mr. Biley, I'm a senior citizen. I'm probably his senior. But if you go back and look at the gas prices when we had back the OPEC embargo, I remember that. Now we're at $4 and higher, and there's no end in sight. There isn't anything out there on the radar that says it's going to go down anytime soon. And Mrs. Carmack's right again. As Mark Twain says, predicting is a very difficult business, particularly when it comes to the future. I'm not predicting the future. What I'm observing is what I'm experiencing every day. I'm filling up my tank. I'm doing 10 gallons. I'm not doing 32 gallons. I'm going to food line. I'm looking for items on the shelf I can't find. The ones I do find, the prices have gone up exponentially. So this is not fast forwarding to the future. This is today. And going back to why you know it's important for us as the workforce for the region, we depend on gas. We don't have public transportation in Powhatan County. So gas gets us to the jobs and back. And when you start decrementing your budget with how much you have to spend on gas, food, and all the other necessities of life, then it becomes real. I've heard supervisors say, well, you know, pennies only, you know, such and such, you know, to the average family, it's only hundred, two hundred dollars. That's a lot of money to senior citizens. It is to me. So anything that I can do this year, I'm going to do in terms of providing some relief. As I said in the workshop the other day, We've got something in the budget for the schools. We've got something in the budget for the county. We need to have something in the budget for the taxpayers, the people we work for. And Mr. Cox already brought up something that was right there in the budget that we haven't discussed. A $1.4 million contingency fund. Now I can tell you when if I go when we go through the school budget and there's things in there that I'm not going to support. There's all kinds of opportunities to lower the rate. And that's what I want to do this year. Mr. Chairman. I'm through. Mr. Clark? Yeah, I'd like to say something. Um, I do know that everyone agreed last year to keep the tax rate the same. Y'all agreed on that. I wasn't part of that. But I would love to lower the tax rate. And I'll never say that I would never not want to rate lower the tax rate, but but I'd be willing to look at it, to look at the numbers, to fine tune the numbers and come to a better agreement. So. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I asked for was a discussion. Since we have a million four of money which is not dedicated to anything just sitting in a contingent fund has been no discussion by the members of this board. And so 
the decrease in tax rate is already in the budget. If we don't spend that money, it doesn't impact it. So I think it's worth the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. One moment. Now it's my turn. That's what I try to do, give everybody an opportunity before it gets all around. Um, <clears throat> All good points. I got a, I, I, it's a tough job, but we all ran because we want to sit up here and we listen to you because we work for you. I watched the tax rate. I haven't voted for the budget the first year when it was, you know, the crystal ball was brought out and told, you know, you're going to only collect 92% of your taxes. I didn't buy that. I've lived in this county since 1963. I asked the uh, treasurer at that time, Ms. Barton, what's the worst tax collection rate we've ever had? 94, that was in 2008 or nine. And we normally collect 97%. It's amazing to me the stories that get out there, but it is Palatine County. And that's what happens is stories, rumors, everybody knows this information and that information. And I'm not sure that's always true. What I do know is that this county runs on you, on your backs. The citizens of this county pay the, the revenue with real estate tax rate. Um, the big cliche when we were running, it was 92% of the revenue comes from you. 8% comes from the businesses. I think that's gotten worse. This board in their vision statement, mission statement, we're, we're gonna improve that. It's hard to improve. You, you gotta bring businesses into this county to improve that. We have a hard job to figure out how do we get the money to do the things that to provide the services that you want, that you need, that you expect, that you should have. We have a budget exactly like you have a budget. We go, to, I agree with Mr. Williams. We go to the store, we fill up the car with gas, or maybe we just put $10 in it, or maybe we put 10 gallons in it, not 30. Um, I remember those days where when you went to the gas station, you had to have the odd number on your license plate to get gas or the even number to get gas. And you can only buy on those days according to your license tag. Well, here's the other side of the coin a little bit, because I do remember last year in 79 cents. And I'll tell you now, I'm at 79 cents. I don't play the game and hide it. I'm up front with you. I'll tell you exactly where I'm at. Uh, the 79 cents is what we agreed to. Um, it is a political football. Um, you go down, everybody loves you until the assessments come out. And when the assessments come out, now everybody's gonna go, oh my gosh, they raise taxes again. Well, we who sit up here, we control the tax rate. We do not control the assessments of your property. We don't do that. When you're paying your tax bill, you want that assessment to be low. When you're selling that house, you want that assessment to be high because you want to be able to justify the price you want for your house. We are no different than you in terms of this county's budget. All the things that you go buy at the grocery store go up. You don't see me in the grocery store very much because my wife goes and it takes me a little bit of time if I go. And everybody up here knows if you go to the grocery store and, I, and I'm in there, there's going to be a long time before I get out. So I just don't go. The, uh, the cost of hiring people, is it down? Did it go down? I don't think so. It went up. Who's going to pay for that? You are. It's your money. I, I, there's just nothing about it that, that, that gets out of sync with that. It's your money, 92% of the money that comes into this county. And quite frankly, I think it's more than that right now, but I haven't asked Mr. Smith recently, but I think it's more than that, that you, you pay. We have to pay for everything that this county does. 
and it's not becoming less expensive to operate this county. It's costing more. Well, it's not coming from the ferry, I'll tell you that. It's coming from you all. We don't control the assessments. We do control the tax rate. The tax rate was at 88. It went to 85. It went to uh, 79 last year. We have the lowest tax rate between Henrico, Chesterfield, Richmond, Hanover, and Goochland is at 53 cents. But if they tell you the whole story, there's a Tuckahoe district in Goochland that pays an additional 35 cents. So the tax rate in Goochland exceeds eight to 80, 85 cents, add them up. There's $1.4 million. I got that tonight. We've had four, five workshops, had never come out to this point, not that I've heard of. Um, the other day, which was last Tuesday, I made a motion in the budget workshop that we maintain our tax rate of 79 cents. It passed three to two. The state. There was no resolution. Am I right, Mr. Latchney? You need a resolution. You need a resolution there to do that. Mistake. We're not perfect. But we have to run this county. We have to provide services. And when you have your spouse, your child, your mother, your whoever, grandparent, and they're laying on the floor, and you got to wait 20 minutes for rescue to get there, Fortunately, that doesn't happen often around here because we, we do have a great rescue unit, great fire department, great sheriff's office. We got a wonderful library. We got great schools. But you guys paid for that. You paid for that. And you continue to pay for it. Two years ago, this board created a revenue stabilization plan. Took a million dollars of money that was in a capital maintenance reserve fund from Powhatan County Public Schools. And they agreed to allow that to come over so we could have a rainy day fund because the gross domestic product was gonna be terrible for the next 10 years. And you know the, 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 the financial markets were all in dire straits. We have to pay bills, we have to run this county, and we have to provide services to you all. Where's the, the magic line that we can have a tax rate and assessments and expenditures that work? We agreed, 79 cent was a pretty good number. We hired a financial guru from Henrico County that had 165 people working under him in finance. He made a model for us that projected out 10 years of how we were gonna run our county and operate and provide the services, the capital improvement projects that we wanted to do. And we were gonna pay cash for them all, predominantly. I think there's maybe six products or six projects that we would have to finance. We're on a pay as you go basis. Me personally, I think that's pretty smart, but I only ran a business for like 25 years in this county. I'd like to know how much Mr. Williams wants to cut the tax rate. I'll answer your question. Great. But first, I'm going to say something. Mr. Byerly, you know you're a businessman. You then know that it's about how you plan, manage, and spend. We can talk about, you know, how things are more expensive to operate. Once again, we're a business. 
and we are a one million nine hundred nine million dollar business called Powhatan County. So again, it comes down to three words, how you plan, manage, and spend in the world we live in. And this whole thing that came out about we're the cheapest in the region, and now we're, you're seeing a little bit of backtracking here tonight. We were told Goochland was higher than us because the county administrator added in the Tuckhoe district, which is a special tax district. If you go out there and look at Weldon Cooper at any other place where they advertise rates, they don't include the special tax districts. Now, I can cherry pick. If we want to say, you know, our neighbors, let's, let's look at them and meet you. Ask yourself what Cumberland's is. Harris is higher. If we go with Planning District 15, which we belong to, go and check the jurisdictions, and there's nine in Planning District 15 called the Richmond Regional Planning District. Check Luvano. I haven't checked Charles City, but that would be another likely one where we're going to be higher. So Using a term that's getting thrown around, it seems like daily transparency. Let's be transparent with you. Let's don't cherry pick. So it's only now after we concatenate the two discussions, do we get a full view of what's going on with the tax rates in the region. Now, one of the things that Mr. Byerly said, we only saw the 104 million tonight. Well, I can tell you, it was presented in the county budget. It was not highlighted in the county administrator's executive summary. It was something Mr. Cox pulled down on his own, I believe. Why didn't we discuss it? Why wasn't it told to us? And as Mr. Byerly said, we do have a rainy day fund, a contingency fund, something the state of Virginia has, something that other localities have that we didn't have when COVID hit. And I applaud the board for making that money available. It was the prudent thing to do. But this contingency fund that's in community development, I can't not sure what it's going to be used for. It's not sitting out there as a special pot of money, it's in community development. In terms of the tax rate this year, I'm in support of a minimum of 77 cents. But I don't know after we have further discussion as Mr. Cox has suggested, I might be able to go lower. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Ms. Carmack. Uh, you had mentioned, um, Mr. Williams, the other day, you know, a $300 tax relief for citizens. And I just want to bring some perspective to what that would look like. If your house is assessed at $350,000, at a 79 cent tax rate, you would be paying $2,765. At a 77 cents ta cent tax rate, you'd be paying $2,695. That's a $70 difference. Um, $500,000, 79 versus 77, you'd be looking at a $100 difference. $250,000, 79 versus 77, you'd be looking at a $50 difference per household. Um, uh, that's nowhere even touches the, and, and that's all money. I mean, fifty dollars is a lot to people. Hundred dollars, seventy dollars, that is, that's something to every citizen. I, I understand that, Mr. Smither. Can you put up your um, your graph showing the uh, seventy-seven versus seventy-nine cent? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain that as well? Sure. Uh, if you go to the next page, uh, Holly. This will give you the modeling that we looked at 
yeah, this is months. basically what the initiatives that the Board of Supervisors has discussed numerous, numerous times. How how would 77 cents in the, in the orange line play out? Uh, and you can see by the second, by 2025, we would drop below our revenue stabilization reserve fund and it continue on a downward path below our minimum fund balance level in 2030. Um, Excuse me, can we make that graph any larger? I'm sorry. This, this, yes, yes, this is the scenario that Mr. Cox asked for a couple of weeks ago. And it shows the, this, the, the red line basically shows our projected fund balance and when we get in trouble for, as far as our cash flow balances uh, based on if the plan that the Board of Supervisors worked on to date. Can you explain what the fund balance is and what it does to the it's citizens? It protects the citizens to make sure the county has enough money in a downturn that we could react in a, in a recession standpoint. Uh, we be, we've always had the, fifth, the blue line you see on the screen, which is our adopted 15% policy. Two years ago, the board entered its wisdom, added an extra 3% cushion, which you see on the gray line. That's the revenue stabilization reserve fund that we, you heard mentioned earlier. And so our, our modeling is basically designed as what tax rate will keep us safe and sound with cash flow basis and still take care of the capital needs that the county needs. And we've talked about school buses, school improvements, sheriff's vehicles, a lot of key essential items are in our capital budget. And the, you know, so apples to apples, if I'm uh, told, if you don't mind rolling back to the other page at 79 cents, you'll see the vision right now that the boards are working on to date uh, uh, with, you know, without the uh, at a 79 cent tax rate. I hope that helps. Mr. Chairman, Thank I'm sorry, you. I'm sorry, Ms. Gomez. Yes, sir, Ms. Cox. Um, Ms. Miller, could we put the 77 cents back up? Yes, sir. Now, this is the hocus pocus about all of this and the reason we need to have some discussions. 77 cents looked bad because all they did was take out revenue. Okay, of course it looked worse. Now, if you take the million four for this year out of the expenses, because you're giving it back to you, you're not spending it in some amorphous contingency fund, this graph begins to change very dramatically. That's the reason we need to have more discussion, Mr. Smither. You can't simply take out revenue. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Smither. I really wish that I know the board met on numerous times on this topic and as recently as last week adopted a component part of our budget, which, which was our healthcare component last week. The board voted 5-0 to approve the health care uh, so that our employees would not be impacted with health care. Uh, that is part of the million four. So the items you're seeing there are all like the million four and contingencies are all items that you have discussed as a board of supervisors and are simply being parked there until we until you give us your final approval and then we will spread it to the other departments. There's no way we would ever have a million four in contingency in our budget, Mr. Cox. And you Mr. Know, and you Mr. Mr. That Smither, that's what it shows in your budget. Does okay, that, that is the reason why I asked to have more discussion, not to make a definitive answer. You've already voted on it, Mr. Cox. You voted for half of it already. So. We have not voted on the budget, Mr. Smither. Okay, the budget voted. still has to be discussed and voted on. We've had two lousy small meetings. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Chairman. Now, thank I, you, Mr. Cox. I have the motion on the floor. I, Mr. Cox. Mr. Byerly, I'll be You're finished. You're out of order, so stop oh, oh, now. Oh, was, okay. Out of order requires a, a vote, does it not, Mr. Lackney? No, I mean, it, you still have- You me out of order. Right, out of order. Technically, it, it would require, if, if first you'd ask the parliamentarian, I technically think he still has the floor and can continue as long as he has the floor, unless there's a motion to end debate, which would take a two thirds vote. And I'm fine with you continuing as Mr. Williams is over here saying, Mr. Byerly too, yeah. one at a time. Okay, well, just let and, me, and, I will, just let one, me finish. If you stop interrupting finished. me, I will let you speak, okay? I had Go not ahead, stopped Mr. when I was talking. Go ahead. This would have been a lot quicker if you hadn't interrupted or started talking again. Um, 
What I want to have is a discussion. We have some interesting information. We have not adopted a budget. <laughs> um, we've had not the kind of discussion on the budget. We haven't even talked about the school budget. And so uh, we have a lot of things to talk about, but here, here sits, uh, we haven't adopted anything, Mr. Smither. Yes, sir, you did. Hmm. You did approve a four and six. Uh, please, please I, I have the floor. Thank you. You will go through the chair, right? He will. Thank you. Okay, I'm finished now. You sure? Yep, good. Mr. Byerly. So, yes, Mr. Williams. Tom, this is a question for you. I think Mr. Barley had the correct answer. He said, you know, we didn't have the public hearing when we voted last time. And I'm guilty. You know, I, I missed it. Okay. We made a mistake. But we should have had the public hearing. I assumed that we were taking that straw vote so the staff would be able to prepare for tonight and know what resolution to prepare. We've done that in the past. So tonight when the public, um, we had the public hearing and now we're taking a roll call vote, are we adopting the rate tonight or did we adopt it in the workshop? That's my question. Well, there's no public hearing requirement unless you raise the rate. So there wasn't a public hearing, just okay. adopting. Um, the, the reason it would needs to be voted on tonight is because the Virginia constitution mentions it being done by ordinance or resolution. So the budget meeting was a, an oral vote to set the resolution amount. And right. tonight the right. formal resolution is before the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. $1.4 million contingency fund. Mr. Smither. We voted last Tuesday to take $465,000 towards to pay for the health care, of which the county had a 19% increase in health care this year. That would be $465,000. We did vote with a 5 0 vote to pay that. Am I right, Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. So out of the $1.4 million contingency fund, that money is gonna be paid from that account. Am I right, Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. Okay. So we have a basically 985,000, whatever the number is left. At that point, what is those funds, what, what is your thoughts of what those funds are earmarked for? Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we had in-depth discussions with the sheriff and the rest of staff as a board to understand the impact of compression on our salary and our, and our ability to recruit and compete in the market. Approximately 400,000 of that money, as, as, you, as the board has seen, is designed to address compression and especially in public safety is, it, it was our starting point of focus. So that's the second piece of that puzzle. The third piece is the cost of living raise that the board has not approved. We had to put it in the budget somewhere and basically chose to commit this spot to put it. And that's all the things that we've went over with the board on throughout our discussions it's over the last month. Yeah, we have had a few meetings. Yes, um, the 1.4 million minus the healthcare 465 minus the compression pay for the sheriff's department. It's compression for, for, every, for all for, of us. for the entire, yes, everybody in the county. It's not limited to sheriff's part, but I know that was instrumental in helping them. And then the cost of living raise that we're having, how much is that roughly? That would be the different for uh, 865 plus uh, about uh, for, for general government, Ms. Ms. Schubert, do you remember, was it a, about a four, I, I'm not sure, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it's, about a, it's gotta be the difference, probably the $400,000. But we had to put that in order to show it to you in a total, so the budget would balance, we had to put it somewhere until you told us how to allocate, you know, what, what you were gonna do. So we have to vote to tell you where to put those funds. We voted to tell you where to put the health care, correct? Yes, sir. Have we voted to, to, we haven't approved the budget yet, so we haven't told you to do the 400,000 for we the compression pack. And once you did, we would allocate it away from where the development to whoever it ends up being. Right. For example, the sheriff's budget. Right. So you put it in the contingency fund line item. Yes, sir. So that it can sit there, sit there until the board makes a decision on how it's gonna appropriate those funds. That sound right? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Thank you for the cl clarification. Yep. The uh, let, let's have a roll call vote on Mr. Cox's motion. You want to repeat that, Mr. Cox? Yes, sir, Mr. Byerly. It's a motion to defer R 2022-10 until our regular April meeting to give the board an opportunity to explore a real estate tax decrease. So a positive vote would be to support this. A negative vote would be to defeat it. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one thing for clarification? Sure. April 1st or April, when you say a regular April meeting, what? what Which is the 20, this is the third week in April, is it not? Correct, but we have to have it out for advertisement by April 1st. Only if we want to change it for June. Yeah, but if we change it, she needs it in order to mail it out. I, I think technically we have to have it done by April 1st. We can't wait till April 28th. Why not? They have to go be mailed. Remember, she said she needs two weeks to process, two weeks to... Um, little help here, guys. She's she needed two weeks to process it, two weeks to ensure it, you know, with the new system to work out any glitches. We went, we went through that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's pretty easy to go to the meeting. I can tell you it was, it was last week's meeting. It was at the one hour and 59 minute mark. And I'll quote you. I make a motion to keep the tax rate at 79 cents for this year. That was my motion. That's my quote. And it's in that meeting at the one hour and 59 minute mark. It was seconded by Ms. Carmack, which is all irrelevant. We're, what we're gonna do is Mr. Cox has put a motion on the floor. Um, I, I know I'm at the 79 cents. I think that's how we should operate. And then once we do our budget settlement, if this board would like to issue a refund to the taxpayers. This board, the majority of this board can do that. That's not a problem. Because it's a budget number. Uh, but the tax rate is what we set. If we're going to issue a refund, that's a different story. So let's have our roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can we make sure we understand which way a yay vote and a nay vote is, is a motion to defer to the regular April meeting. Yes means defer this decision. No means don't defer it. Thank you. And we do need to mail it by the- it, The tax first. bills will be late. Yeah. It, can I say I, one, Mr. Chair? I'm yes, not going to lower the tax rate and cut our public services of what we've already agreed. I'm not going to do that. Okay, let's just do you the know, you, are you, you, I'm not cutting public services. I'm are you cutting fine? the sheriff's office or our public servants at all? Yes, sir. Okay, are, are, you, are you ready? Yeah, All right. Right. Mr. Smith, hey, Mr. Chair, roll call, Mr. Chairman, could we clarify something? Yes, sir, Mr. Scott. Ms. Answer Mrs. Carmack's question a little bit better. Okay. okay. The April 1st is if you're going to reduce the tax rate. Okay. If we discuss this and we will not be able to reduce the tax rate in June, but we would be able to in uh, November. Okay. okay. So it doesn't affect doesn't have to affect the tax bill, but because we have waited so late in this process, we cannot get the June billing. I understand that. Okay, let's have our roll call vote. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. No. Mr. Cox. Aye. Ms. Carmack. No. Mr. Barley. No. so many notes i lost what page i was on we gotta go back we still gotta do the regular motion yep i got it okay i'm gonna make the motion that we like i did the other day um i'll make the motion we maintain our tax rate at 79 cents for this year we need a second i'll second that so the motion is to adopt the resolution as opted in the packet right mr chairman oh, oh. yes sir mr williams i'd like to introduce a substitute motion the substitute motion is a tax rate of 77 cents. Do you have a second for that? Second. So, Mr. Latchney, with the substitute motion, we've got to vote on that. You vote on that first, first. whether the resolution, you're taking them 79 cents out and plugging 77 cents into the resolution. Right. So, you the, have to vote on that first. Yeah. And you so, can do it all in favor there because it's not the actual resolution. Right. So, it would be the uh, taking the 79 cents out and replacing it with 77 cents. Correct. And we don't need to do a roll call. 
all in favor of 77 cents, say aye. Now, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to go back to Mr. Lackney's last comment. On this, you don't need a roll call. No, because you're not actually voting on the actual resolution. You're only voting on whether that number inside the resolution be 77 or 79. Okay. okay. It's going to take another vote. Even if the 77 prevails, it'll take a second. That, that's why I wanted to get clarification yes. on. Thank you. We do a roll call for clarity. You can if you want. Okay, we'll do a roll call on the 77 cent number. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. No. Mr. Cox. Aye. Ms. Carmack. No. Mr. Barley. No. Now we go back to the original motion. And that is to maintain the current tax rate, 79 cents this year. Mm. In the, let's just do it this way. Let me rephrase it here. Move to approve resolution R 2022-10 as presented. I'll second that. Uh, roll call, Mr. Smith. Mr. Williams. No. Mr. McClung. Yes. Mr. Cox. No. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Barley. Aye. Motion passes three to two. Tax rate will be 79 cents. Next, we go to uh, the Substantial Accord Appeal with Belldale Solar. Captain, come on up. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, good evening, Mr. Chair and Supervisors. My name is Drew Price with Hexagon Energy in Charlottesville, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Belldale Solar. Um, and uh, tonight's hearing, as you heard earlier, people clarify, is, is solely focused on our appeal of the substantial accord determination at the Planning Commission. So tonight is not about the conditional use permit or the conditions as some of the previous public commenters have alluded to. I hope to be able to talk with y'all at a future date about that conditional use permit and the conditions that we have developed in conjunction with the county and neighbors to provide economic benefits and protect the land. But tonight's really just about the comprehensive plan. And the rural areas section of the Powhatan comprehensive plan specifically envisions solar as a use in the rural areas. Similarly, the Powhatan Zoning Ordinance, which works hand in hand with the comprehensive plan, allows solar as a conditional use in the A10 district. So as I plan to show tonight, this solar project is substantially in accord with the comprehensive plan. And we respectfully ask that the board overrule the Planning Commission's determination. I know y'all have a full agenda tonight and I'll try and be brief, but given that this is the first time discussing this project with y'all, I wanna give you enough context to show how we meet the, the comprehensive plan. And so starting with location, um, as you saw from your planning staff, they did analysis last October, there are a limited number of locations in Powhatan County that are viable for solar projects. So this is obviously an outline of the county. Um, those are the major power lines that run through the county and the blue dots are substations. Solar projects need to be close to power lines or substations. When you add in the buildings in Powhatan County and zones where solar is not an allowed use under your ordinance, you see that a lot of areas, especially the areas near 60, um, are no longer viable. They're, they're out of bounds. When you add in the natural conservation, then you see that further, many of the areas near power lines are no longer viable. And what you're left with is small areas near the power lines that are open and suitable for a solar project. And not surprisingly, this is where the solar projects that you've approved have been located. And similarly, that's where Belldale is located. 
in an area outside of the protected zones, outside of priority conservation, in a zone where it's allowed and adjacent to a power line. It's important to note that this project, unlike the first project that was presented before you years ago, which I wasn't involved with, is not at all in the priority conservation area. So you can see there an outline of the parcel. A substantial amount of the parcel does fall within the priority conservation area, but the project is not in that area. So the corridors that run north to south that Powhatan has designed and designated as priority conservation remain uninterrupted. And up near the project, those corridors are 3.3 miles wide across there. This project would be capped at 350 acres. That's far less than the 500 acres suggested in the comprehensive plan. Um, and it's less than the actual combined size of what was approved for Scott Solar 1 and 2. And it's important to note that all of these projects that have been approved in the county have been located in the rural areas. On the parcel itself, the parcel is nearly 3,000 acres. It's one, if not the largest parcel that you have left in the county. And the project would use about 10% of that for the solar project, leaving the other 90% in an undisturbed state. So that includes wetlands, riparian buffers, which I'll touch on more, and perimeter buffers, that those combined represent 40%. So using 10% of the land, protecting 40% of the land, keeping the remaining 50% in timber. So as folks have alluded to earlier, there is an entire section on the rural areas um, of which it starts out on page 69 of your comprehensive plan. And it mentions things like thriving farms, wooded and forested areas and silver culture, which are all things that this project supports continuing on this land. In particular, in terms of thriving farms, you've all received a letter from the landowner, Mr. Purcell, that talks about what it's like to be an independent timber owner in the world of modern conglomerate timber businesses. And the fact of the matter is, like a lot of you know, you have to have a mix of income streams to survive as an independent farmer. So this is actually enabling timber farming to continue on this property. Again, 90% of the property will be wooded or managed forest areas. The silviculture will be about half of the property. And the big reason for that is that 450 acres that have been historically timbered have now been committed through a condition for additional buffers around the riparian areas. So 450 acres formerly timbered now will no longer be timbered to protect the watersheds that run through that property. This project is specifically permitted, as it's stated on page 76, only 350 acres will be used. And again, none of it is in the priority conservation area. The comp plan goes on to, on page 76, state that with certain conditions, solar energy farms may be appropriate within rural areas. It, Further goes on to say, to help ensure compatibility with surrounding rural landscapes and uses, the following features should be considered when siting and designing solar energy farms. And then it lists six features that it suggests that people looking to site a solar energy farm in the county do to make it fit. Those are listed here. I'm going to go through them in detail in the next slides, but this project was specifically designed and redesigned not only to meet all of those, but to exceed them. We're not asking for any variances from any of this stuff. We meet all those. So the first one, proximity to major thoroughfares. That up there is the major thoroughfare plan from the comprehensive plan. The red star is where this project is located. It is adjacent to a major thoroughfare on the map, and it will use major thoroughfares for construction traffic. As you know, and as some of the previous public commenters mentioned, a construction management plan has to be developed and approved by VDOT and the county. Screening and buffering. This project features buffers around the perimeter ranging from 200 to 700 feet. And those consist of mature pines, five years of emerging growth, and new pines that are being planted as we speak. They're out there this week at 542 pines per acre. It's extremely dense. 
Um, along Cartersville Road and Duke Road, based on feedback from neighbors, we have widened the buffers in areas to ensure that panels won't be seen. And we've agreed to a taller fence with an opaque screen to ensure that even in the dead of winter, which is these pictures, you can't see it. In summer, with all the leaves, you don't even see into the property. Protection of natural resources. As I mentioned, the planning, uh, the uh, comp plan suggests 200 foot minimum buffer. That exists not only for the project area, but also voluntarily for the entire parcel, the entire 3000 acre parcel. The landowner has voluntarily agreed to a 200 foot buffer around all those wetlands at the request of Dr. Riley. And then pollinators will be planted under the panels in those panel areas, which is actually going to improve water quality and provide a more diverse habitat than monoculture pines. It's important here to note that solar projects both in the state and in this county are subject to requirements to help protect natural resources that agriculture and timber don't have to meet. So if you'll see there on the left, you know, timber and agriculture has no required road buffer, no required property line buffer, um, a 50 foot riparian buffer, which is best practices, no stormwater requirements, as you've heard tonight, timbering can sometimes lead to issues in streams, no traffic requirements, no additional county restrictions on herbicide or pesticide use, and no requirements around biodiversity. By contrast, on the right are all the requirements that solar farms must meet in this county through the wisdom that y'all have done as you've learned and improved these projects and through the state. So it has to have a stormwater plan. It has to have stormwater management in place has to have a construction plan. Protection of cultural resources. We've had a phase 1A cultural historical survey of the site area. There are no cultural resources within the site area and the project is not visible from any historic site. And then finally, project size. Again, the project will be less than 350 acres, but on top of that, and again, response to comments from in fact, two of the folks who spoke with you tonight, um, Ms. Wood and, and Ms. Adcock, we've agreed to a voluntary condition that prohibits any additional solar energy on this property, the entire 3,000 acres for the life of the project. It would be it. This project, if approved, would be it. So again, the section of the Virginia code that we're talking about tonight is called 2232. It says substantially in accord with the adopted comprehensive plan or part thereof. And consistency with the comprehensive plan is determined by whether our proposed plan meets the requirements that are in your comprehensive plan. And those are set forth again in that land use and community character chapter under rural lands. Again, it states with certain conditions, solar energy farms may be appropriate within rural areas. And it says to help ensure their compatibility with surrounding rural landscapes. The comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2019 and again approved in 2021, clearly envisioned solar in rural areas. And we fully, let alone substantially, meet the conditions and considerations. And so we'd ask that the board overrule the determination and provide an opportunity for us, as people have indicated before, for our application to be heard at the Planning Commission. Um, I now wanna hand it over briefly to our attorney, Karen Carmack, or sorry, Karen Cohen, um, to, um, to tell you just a little bit about the basis of tonight's decision, because again, I think it's important that it not get confused with the conditional use permit, which we hope to discuss in the future. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I am Karen Cohen. I'm a partner with Gentry Lock in Richmond and I represent the applicant who's the petitioner in this appeal. Uh, so Drew and I talked about who should go first and decided it was best to start with, with Drew to give you some context to the legal part. Um, and while Drew's presentation I think is quite compelling standing alone, I do wanna to briefly touch on the law because there are important legal parameters that guide consideration of the issue before you. First, uh, as Drew said, this is an appeal pursuant to part B of section 15.2-2232 uh, of the state code. 
And this is the part of the statute that permits an applicant to come to you and ask the board to overrule the planning commission's substantial accord determination. Um, and as, as you said earlier, Mr. Chairman, no other matter relating to the Belldale Solar Project is before the board tonight. Our, our only request is that the board overrule the planning commission's SIA determination. And I say SIA because it gets, it's substantial, the exact language from the code is substantially in accord. So we often refer to it as SIA because it gets unwieldy to keep saying substantially in accord. So we say SIA so we don't have to say all those words, but those words are important um, because they derive from part A of section 15.2-2232. And I think it's important, especially for the public, to understand what that statute really says and what it doesn't say. Um, so 2232 review or SIA review, which is done by the Planning Commission, is sometimes called a public facilities review. And you know that's because, as you know, it doesn't happen for every development project. It happens for public facilities. And in Virginia, solar projects have to go through this 2232 public facilities review because they're providing electricity, which is a public utility, and the statute refers to public utility facilities. But just for context, other facilities, other public facilities have to go through SIA 2232 review, like um, a public school, for example, would have to go through that process if, and this is really, this is the key thing about the scheme of this statute that it is admittedly hard to grasp because all of 2232A is just a big long run on sentence of legalese. So it's, it's pretty rough, but the scheme of part A is that if a public facility is already shown on the comprehensive plan, then it doesn't need to go through a planning commission 2232 review. So for example, if part of the comp plan said public high school number 10 or whatever it is called is going to be located here and it was shown on a map or otherwise described in the comprehensive plan, you wouldn't need to have a 2232 review for that public high school. But then what 2232A goes on to say is if it's not shown as a feature, and that's the word that's used, if it's not shown as a feature on your comprehensive plan, then you need to have it submitted to the planning commission and the, what the applicant, and it could be the county, needs to submit to the planning commission is quote, the general location or approximate location, character and extent of what's being proposed. So if it was a school, public school, you'd have to say about where it's approximately where it's gonna be located as to character and extent, is it a high school, an elementary school? How big will it be? These are the things that come at this stage of the review. And so it needs to be enough information about the project to meet these general re requirements of location, ex character and extent being submitted for review. Not every specific detail of the project because remember the 2232 is not the land use case. The land use case is still to come. Um, all that happens at this stage for the planning commission is to, to determine whether this type of project is, and again, quote, substantially in, in accord uh, with the comprehensive plan, uh, which, you know, substantially in accord does not need to be wholly in accord with the entirety of the comprehensive plan, because the statute says that the proposed public facility only needs to be substantially in accord with the comprehensive plan or a part thereof. So that's the key language from 2232A. So I, I apologize if, if we're giving a legal lecture, but I think it's, it's important to go through all that because I wanted it to be clear to the public to, to understand that the board is not approving or disapproving the proposed Belldale Solar Project tonight. The board will make that land use decision on the application later. And I, you know, how do we know this? It's not just me saying this. We know this because this is what the Supreme Court of Virginia has said and the Attorney General of Virginia have said, and I'm quoting, a comprehensive plan generally does not by itself act as an instrument of land use control. Rather, the plan serves as a guideline for the development and implementation of a zoning ordinance. And we know that Powhatan County understands this quite well because it says the very same thing in its zoning ordinance. In the zoning ordinance that you've adopted, it expressly states that the zoning ordinance, and I'm quoting again, 
is for the purpose of, among other things, uh, implementing the Powhatan County Comprehensive Plan. That's in your zoning ordinance at section 83-102. And we know this is the case for solar. And how do we know? Because again, the board adopted a zoning ordinance implementing the comprehensive plan by permitting solar energy facilities in an area that is, and again, I'm quoting from your ordinance, agrarian and low density rural character. That's in your zoning ordinance at section 83-162, where solar energy facilities are allowed as a conditional use in the A-10 district. So, and, and by the way, just to address a comment that came up earlier, so there's no confusion, and, and your attorney can tell you this too, but there was a comment about the uh, state code referring to special exceptions and that a and this is a conditional use permit, the state code only refers to special exceptions and the various localities have different types of special exceptions. They can be SUPs, CUPs, or SPs or SEs. So as special use permit, conditional use permit, special exception, special permit, it's kind of the alphabet soup of land use law, unfortunately, but the state code only refers to special exceptions, but a CUP, a conditional use permit, it is a type of special exception. So just wanted to clarify that. So there's a clear basis for overruling the, uh, the SIA determination, um, a clear legal basis. But finally, I just wanna conclude by talking through a little bit, what is the practical effect? If the board overrules the SIA, then the planning commission will have a chance to consider the merits of the conditional use permit. And the board will have a further opportunity to address the issue of comprehensive plan conformity in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, again, your zoning ordinance requires that for you to issue a conditional use permit, you must find that the conditional use permit, and again, I'm quoting, is consistent with the purposes, goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. That's at 83-123 of your zoning ordinance. And if the board were to approve a solar siting agreement, which is permissible under state uh, legislation, then the project is deemed, quote, to be substantially in accord with the comprehensive plan of the host locality, thereby satisfying the requirements of 15.2-2232. And that is in the state code at 15.2-2316.9. So if you act favorably on our petition for appeal tonight, the outcome will be one that not only accords with the law, and with due respect for the landowner's right to a lawful process, but also is in the public interest because it would allow the process to continue. The applicant can further address issues and concerns of citizens in the planning commission, like some of the, some of the things that were brought up tonight. There was, uh, for example, one of the citizens read some conditions from another project and suggested that those be considered for this conditional use permit uh, application. So the Planning Commission would then provide a substantive and meaningful recommendation on the conditional use permit to the board, giving citizens, staff, the applicant, the commission, the best opportunity to continue to work on conditions and to address any concerns so that the project not only meets this initial threshold of substantial accord, which it clearly does, but comes to the board as the best possible project it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carmack, this is in your district. I'll make a motion, sir. Uh, before we do that, could I ask a process question? If it's a process question, yes. You may. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm confused, Mr. Lackney, um, and help me. In uh, February 25, 2019, uh, we had the same situation, uh, actually with uh, the predecessor of this, and we held public hearings uh, on both the determination, planning commission determination, and as well as the project itself. We had, we had public hearings scheduled for that. We had public hearings scheduled on November 23, 2020 uh, for, uh, the three bridge where we looked at whether it was in uh, substantial accord with the public, uh, with, with the comprehensive plan. So in both of those in the past, we've had public hearings on this. And in fact, uh, it appears that the applicant asked uh, that uh, uh, they requested a public hearing be scheduled on the appeal. So 
help me understand why we didn't advertise this and have because it's different from what we've done in the past well st state law technically the 15 22 32 that council kept referring to it doesn't say that if on the appeal there needs to be a second public hearing there's nothing in state code that requires it we may have done it and i don't recall the specifics on those previous instances because they were a while back but state law does not mandate a public hearing. There would be, if, if the board override, overrules the planning commission, there would still be a public hearing on the CUP, which has not occurred yet. And so uh, I'm not sure how those others played out, what the difference was, um, or, or okay. I don't remember that. Could, could you tell me once again, the process, if what happens if we agree with the planning commission and what happens if we disagree with the planning? What, 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 what happens? Well, what, what state law and as council was pointing out as state law, what state law says is you cannot authorize this development if it's not in substantial accord with the comp plan, if, if no 2232 substantial court finding is made. That's why at the planning commission, when they said we, three to two, we don't believe it's a substantial accord. We didn't even get to their CUP request because it was my opinion, the planning commission couldn't authorize it when in fact it had been determined that it wasn't in substantial accord. So if the board upholds that, then then in my view, the matter is, is done because no substantial accord was found and the CUP never gets heard. If the board reverses the planning commission, then the CUP would go back on the agenda and whatever happens to the planning commission, the CUP would then come here and, and there would be public hearings in both places. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the board of supervisors overturns the planning commission's finding and case 2109 CUP Belder Solar is found to be in compliance with the comprehensive plan. I'll second that. Any comments, discussion, questions? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I have been to this property. I've met with residents. I've met with my constituents. I've met with the developer. I've met with the landowner. I've walked the property myself. I don't know if my other colleagues have or not, but I've actually walked the property. Um, I'm torn between this because um, the, I believe in the, the, uh, the owner's rights that he has to do what he wants with his property. And I believe that the developer of the solar has met and looked at, he's tried to listen to the residents and to apply what they have requested. And I think they've met that. So I will. I would like, I would probably, I am gonna let it go back to the planning commission for review. After I've seen with my eyes and, my, and I've been out there, I know what, uh, I can envision what will be out there. So um, I'm gonna let the planning commission review it again. I did like what Ms. Brown said earlier about different agriculture aspects we could, to, we could add to the project. And I'm sure that um, the developer and landowner would agree to some conditions, so. That's it. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make one uh, quick comment on um, why I feel that it is in accord with the comprehensive plan. Um, like they said, we said earlier tonight, the only thing we're discussing is it basically going back to the planning commission to be heard as a conditional use permit. Um, our most recent comprehensive plan, we, spoke, we spent close to a year going through that page by page. It has a page dedicated to solar guidelines in the rural preservation section in the land use and community char character chapter. As the applicant said, per our zoning ordina ordinance, the only area that a solar farm is permitted is in by a CUP in A10. We've approved four solar farms out of those four, two abut priority conservation areas, all three are adjacent to protected lands and one borders a recreational lake. The planning commission recently revisited solar farms, yet no changes were made in our comprehensive uh, plan or zoning ordinance. 
But what probably is the most concerning to me in this case actually involves the applicant. Uh, Drew Price uh, first approached the county in November of 2020. He had a pre-application meeting in June of 2021. Subsequently, he's had upwards of close to 40 meetings. He had 16 neighborhood meetings, two community meetings, six staff meetings, eight planning commissioner meetings, four supervisor meetings, plus phone calls, conference calls, and emails. And in that time period, no one told him that he wasn't in accord with the comprehensive plan. He may not even be heard. Section um, for our solar energy farms, the infamous page 76 says, since these facilities require large open areas to operate, they will likely locate outside the designated growth areas with certain conditions, solar energy farms may be appropriate within rural areas. So we're not even gonna let him present his conditions. Um, I just look at the hours upon hours of work and probably the tens of thousands of dollars at this point that this applicant and land, landowner have put towards this project. And we don't have the respect to even allow him to present his case. Um, I'm a business owner and I can say that if I went to a company and presented something and they said, yeah, you know, let's proceed. And I went to them upwards of 40 times and spent tens of thousands of dollars on a prototype. And I got to the board of directors and they wouldn't even hear me. That wouldn't put a very good taste in my mouth. We often wonder why Powhatan has a, uh, a negative image or an image that we're trying to reverse in the business community or just in the development community in general. That's probably why. So I think uh, we owe this applicant a seat at the table to at least present his case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Cox. Um, interesting comment about respect and what we owe the applicant. Um, the applicant has come before us before same situation, and we've rejected them. Didn't hear the case. We've done that with the second Cypress Creek. So it's not a question of respect. These are business people. They, are, they understand the difficulties of getting these projects cited. So I don't feel sorry for them. I'm not worried about that. What I am interested in is uh, Mrs. Adcock and the 100 plus citizens that are in your district, Mrs. Carmack, who do not want this project, who do not feel like it represents maintaining the rural character of Powhatan. That's what I'm interested in, is maintaining the rural character of Powhatan and a um, industrial grade electrical manufacturing and storage facility, and that's what it is, it's not a solar farm. Industrial grade electrical manufacturing and storage facility visible from the highways. Don't shake your heads because it is. So um, if you look at the grade, you can't keep it from being seen. So uh, I'm sorry, I take a different tack than Mrs. Carmack. Um, uh, it's not unusual for us to disagree. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Okay. Let's. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> Let's um. We we we've, we've, we're here. Let's take our vote. Um. And we don't need to do a roll call vote with this, do we? Probably wouldn't hurt. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. <laughs> Mr. Williams, Mr. What, 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 what are we hold voting on? on? Hold on. Ms. Hold Carmack on. made a motion to, approve, to reverse. <laughs> There's a motion. The, yeah, Ms. Carmack made a motion There's to reverse. There's been a second the to that motion. motion. It was only like 10 minutes ago. I understand, but I want to know what the yay and nay votes mean. That's all. Oh, 
Yeah, are you okay? Yay reverses the planning commission. Nay upholds 41. the planning yeah, commission. 41 on the, in the book. You want to vote nay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Smither, roll call vote. Mr. Williams. No. Mr. McClung. Yay. Mr. Cox. No. Ms. Carmack. Yay. Mr. Barley. Yay. Thank you, Mr. Carmack, for the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just keep it easy. Um, public hearings. Mr. Barley, before we launch in that, could we take a little break? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That is a good idea because we got five or six to go. Five minute break. <laughs>
Just real quick. Um, we're going to go to public hearings, ordinance 02022-12, amending the Powhatan County Code of Ordinances to amend the provisions of Chapter 70, Article 2, exemptions for elderly and handicapped. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, this public hearing, 02022-12, if approved, will facilitate an increase in the real estate tax exemption afforded to qualifying elderly and handicapped taxpayers doubling the maximum exemption from $800 to $1,600. Mr. Chair. Um, do we have, yes, Mr. Uh, McClung. I'd like to make a motion. Well, let's have our public hearing first, okay? okay. Let's hold on one All second. Right. We'll have that public hearing. Okay. Right. Does anyone from the public want to speak on this topic? Anyone on Zoom? Zoom is clear. Not seeing anyone coming down, no one on Zoom. Go ahead, Mr. McClung. I'd like to make a motion to move to approve ordinance 0 202 12 as presented. Roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Uh, discussion. Discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Cox. Uh, Ms. Smither, um, what's the cost of this? Uh, we, 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 we should know what we're, what we're, what we're obligating. I like, I like what we're doing, but uh, what's it going to cost us? Uh, 200000 Additional, yes, sir. Okay, so it's now in the budget is seven hundred shown as the proposed budget shown as seven hundred twenty-five thousand yes, from five fifty to okay, and that includes other exemptions. As this is part of that uh, a total, a, a larger total. Okay, so that's approaching two cents. Yes, but yes, it, okay, that's it, it's not all for that purpose. Sir. The seven twenty. No, 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 but the, yes, the exemptions. Okay, thank the, you. You're welcome. The exemptions or what we have is we're doubling the tax credit on the elderly and for the veterans to go from $800 credit on real estate taxes to $1,600 for the elderly. And I think the criteria is about $50,000 of income. Yes, sir, $50,000 in income as a, uh, it must be less than $50,000 in income, net worth exclusive of the home site in an acre of uh, $200,000. Right. So Mr. McClung has made a motion. I'll, I'll second. Go ahead, Ms. Carmack. I'll second it. Roll call vote, Mr. Smither. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Byerly. Aye. Motion passes. Next on the agenda, 020211. Case 2202-AZ, <coughs> Powhatan, go ahead, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Ordinance 022, 20, uh, 22-11, case 22-02-AZ, requests the amendment of section 68, article three uh, concerning access management standards and requires a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Hopkins is here to, up to, to update us on the ordinance. Mr. Hopkins. Let's see if that works. Yes, it's okay. Replacing it with VDOT standards. We have, uh, we currently have access management standards that are particular to Powhatan County. In our research, we found that the majority of counties in the Commonwealth do not use uh, their own standards. The only one we found was Goochland. Uh, but in an evaluation of our own, we focused on the growth areas along 60, which usually is when a lot of applications come in. Um, we found that basically 265 parcels in the growth area of the ones um, uh, you, that couldn't meet Powhatan standards was 233, and with VDOT standards is 213. So really, we're only talking about 20 parcels. Um, basically, the rules as constituted are kind of controlling for the exception and not the rules. What I would say is kind of a, a lay term of it. In the past five years, 77% of uh, applications that have come through have needed a waiver. So basically, most applications that come here, we we need access we management waivers for, um, and if you broke it down by mile, uh, the difference of 625 feet versus 495 or 425, no, 495 feet versus 625 feet, um, or basically between these standards, 
uh, in a mile basis without counting for the individual parcels is 10 versus eight um, access points. So really to switch from Powhatan standards, VDOT standards is gonna go from 10 per mile to eight, eight access points per mile. Um, and again, if we remove these, all of that uh, vetting of that process will go to VDOT and their engineers will determine the best point of access for um, applications that come through. Currently in our rezonings, we require a traffic impact analysis. Uh, so any rezoning that comes through, we offer traffic impact, we require traffic impact analysis. As the director, I do have the ability to waive it. And so in some circumstances that may be appropriate, um, but right now that is currently what we have is that you have to have traffic impact analysis on a rezoning. In Goochland, they break that out into a whole separate grouping of things. Um, and you can see them here. Uh, depending on what the project is, they might offer uh, different requirements. Out of planning commission, planning commission's desire to send to the board was that uh, you would have a traffic impact analysis on any land use case. So whether it be a CUP or rezoning, uh, anything that came before us, we, they wanted to have all the information up front so that they could um, determine what was best. So I would think um, my position is at least the rezoning we have, the majority of the, the the land use cases that we get are going to need a rezoning. So you're going to get a TIA the majority of the time. As far as the access management side of things, the needing of the waivers, um, it seems like VDOT is probably best capable to deal with those. And so I think it's prudent to approve this to make that happen. Um, what we want to do about the TIA, um, my main concern is making sure that it's just equitable and making sure that everybody is on the same footing. And I think removing it and just leaving it at the rezoning will have more than enough oversight. And it's hard for me proactively to think right now about what in the future we might need a TIA for um, that isn't already captured by the majority of the rezonings that we're gonna get. And so I think any issues that we might come across, I think we can fix reactively. You know, we might find a project we said, you know, we might've wanted a TIA on that. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll change the ones to address that. But right now, I can't really think of what that is outside of the majority of the rezonings that we're going to get. So um, I'll take questions. Okay. Well, let's see if we have anybody from the public that would like to speak. Steve Barrow, 3492 Richards Run, District 3, Powhatan, Virginia. Uh, what I can gather, we're talking about changing rain the the turn lanes going into a business, shopping center, something like that. Uh, I think it's a pet peeve of mine. Ain't nothing worse than me going down 60. People go halfway up the turn turn lane, then slam on brakes, then get over. A whole lot of wrecks happen that way. Uh, I hate to see us reduce the lane. If you want to go think VDOT's so great, drive through Midlothian. Drive up through Chesterfield County. I guess what they go by. Same thing with uh, Henrico County, short pump area. Uh, what we got seems like it's been working if we enforce it. Well, sometimes we haven't enforced it. So I ask you, please just keep what we have. Uh, hopefully that will keep working and maybe we can get people to use the whole length of the lane. So thank you. Not seeing anyone else. Mr. Smith, anyone on Zoom? Zoom is clear, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Um, board members, comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, Ms. Carmack. That we- uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call Frank back up for a question. Uh, excuse, I was- in oh, Hold on, we're making a motion. Go ahead. Go ahead with your motion. I you would can't like- can't have the floor until you have the motion made. Yeah, I would like to make the motion that we approve Zero dash or O dash two zero two two dash one one. In the second. Second. Floor is now open, Mr. Williams. Chair, Frank, you said 70% needed uh, some type of waiver. 77% in the last five years. In the last five years. What type of waiver? I mean, question. was it entrance spacing? That's the predominant waiver. Um, so how, sure. how many were there that actually came in that needed a waiver of the, I want to get at how you calculated 
Was it a large number or a small number? Because percentages can be misleading. Sure. Yeah, I was the one that put that together. It was looking at our rezonings and conditional use permits and site plans that we've processed over the past five years. Um, I'd have to pull back up my uh, original spreadsheet I was working on to see what that baseline number was, but it was, you know, I think we all know the, the rough number of CUPs, rezoning site plans we've worked on the past few years. So. Because, you know, last time, Brett, when we had this conversation, when you were up, we went through the ones where, you know, we did a waiver and it was like five, six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to get my arms around when you say 70%, again, 70% of what number? Because again, percentages can be misleading. Sure, yeah, it, it, again, I don't offhand have the exact number, but it was looking at the rezoning as the CUPs on 60, which was, yeah, it was probably in the five or six range. We hadn't had that many actually. Okay, when you go back and you looked originally the 265 parcels on right 60, when we had our original discussion, yeah. um, they couldn't meet the 625 entrance standards. Okay, and then I ask you, well, go back and look at how many would be able to develop using the VDOT 495 standard. That reduced the number down to what? I believe it was 213. It's in the report here, but I want to say it was 213. Yeah. Is that right? It's 220 to 213, I believe that's right. Right, and then, you know, we looked at how many parcels of that number you know, could actually be developed because of their size, topography, yeah, and a little, you know, a little bit of subjectivity in looking at that, but, you know, we've done this for a while now. So looking at ones that are either too narrow, you, know, you can't build anything yeah. on them, have wetlands, have riparian buffers, have streams, have extreme topography. Um, I would say about another 40 you could exclude that, that aren't developable. They'd have to be combined with other parcels or they'll just never So be. when you pull them out, that left, how many? I think it's 12. Yeah, we have uh, have the full chart here, but it was then uh, it, yeah, it had fewer parcels once you start to narrow it down. If you do the math, if you start doing the subtractions, you add up the subtractions and put that against the 265, it looks like it's around 12. Mm -hmm. What was the number you're looking for? Is that correct? Sorry, 12 would be would be what we had 213 roughly that would need a waiver from VDOT. Um, and then of those 40 wouldn't, I don't think be developable. So uh, that would be like 170 so, left. Excuse me? That would be like 170 then left parcels on 60 that would not meet uh, VDOT. So would still need a waiver from VDOT. Oh. Excuse me. So let's go to something. All right, we started with 265 parcels. Yep. Of those, 233 cannot meet the 625 foot requirement, access requirement. Then 213 would appear uh, would appear unable to meet the VDOT minimum. Uh, stand. So that's 213. Then approximately 40 of those parcels. So if you take the 213 and add that to 40, that's uh, correct. So yeah, if, if in the uh, chart here, are you all seeing that? No. Um, the, the chart that we have titled Route 60 Growth Areas on the right, we had 47, uh, one and four. So then yeah, if you took the 40 off of that, you're, you're correct. It would be 12 left. Yeah. 12 left. Um, Brad, I look at um, when we're taken out, I think it's important. The whole conversation started about spacing, the 625 versus the 425. And then we had a motion that said, let's just default to VDOT, take everything out that we had done. The access management standards, again, were developed back in 2004 on the planning commission, I was on it. Kurt Turner, who later became the planning director of Chesterfield, assisted us on that effort. 
And so the people in the audience will understand because it, you can't really understand from the report. Frank wasn't here. That's in defense of you, Frank. So the reason we did that is because we knew as a rural county, we need to protect and preserve our roads in Powhatan County, not only for public safety, but for through traffic capacity, et cetera because we knew we weren't gonna get the federal funds. We get, as Brett knows, we get two votes down at the Richmond Regional Transportation Planning Organization. And the big four, well, they get the big, you know, they get the, the big votes and they get the big bucks. So the competition for the federal dollars was gonna be very intense for a rural county like Palatine County. So again, it was very important for us to do everything that we could for public safety and road capacity in Powhatan County. Mrs. Carmack remembers, and she was on the planning commission, they did something great. When we had Walmart come in, I forget what year it was, was it 2006? Okay, but anyway, they insisted on double turn lanes going into Walmart. Wow, hasn't that paid off for us? Now, we didn't need them probably at that time, but haven't they been a benefit to us today? Because the planning commission had the forethought to say, no, we need to do this, not for today, but for tomorrow. Now, when I look at, we're taking out all these things, you know, auxiliary lanes, you know, standards. And a lot of the localities, what they'll do is, before I come back to what we're taking out, they won't have their own access management standards replete. What they'll have is different things like Chesterfield. Any of the major roads, you come in with their development, you're gonna put in a turn lane. Okay, but they don't have their own access management standards. Goochland does, and Goochland does something very good, you know, for the development community. They classify every road by name, and they give it a, a number. The number corresponds to a category, major, minor arterial, collector, major collector, minor collector, local road, and they assign what, if you're gonna come in with an entrance, or development on that road, these are the standards you're gonna to have to meet. So it's published right up front. You see it. Traffic impact analysis, they don't uh, depend on VDOT. VDOT I think goes by peak hours. You know, if you're generating more than a hundred and they also have a secondary condition. I don't recall exactly what it is, but Anyway, Goochland gets into different scenarios where if you're increasing traffic, for example, by a certain percentage on a collector road, then they wanna know that and they will require it. It may not be a hundred, but because of the category of the road, it's important that the traffic impact study be done so that they know the impact. So when we start taking out everything, intersection standards, shared driveways, interparcel connections, we need to be aware of what we're doing because this isn't just about, as we started out, using the spacing on race 16, you know, and saying, well, we need to do this for economic development. As you heard me say earlier, we have to get in and out of this county. We can ill afford to turn race 60 into Midlothian or short pump because we won't be able to get in and out of this county. As a rural county, we go to work every day in the Richmond region outside of this county. So I'm going to be opposing this tonight for the reasons I just went through. 
I'm absolutely positive that I'm not going to prevail on the vote. But I think it's important that you know why we did this and understand and make up your minds for yourself the efficacy of taking all of this out and just defaulting to VDOT because everything you see in Middle Othian short pump, VDOT approved. And I'm not VDOT bashing. I think VDOT does a good job with what they have, with their, with their mission, because as a regional director told me one time at a PDs, or excuse me, RRTPO meeting, he said, we want to say yes to development. It's up to us whether or not we have the political will to be able to have the type of access management and type of traffic we want in Powhatan County. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Weeps, you're very welcome. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Carmack. Uh, to make a couple of points, I first would like to address uh, the citizen that came up and mentioned about uh, VDOT. <laughs> VDOT in 2017 had a major overhaul to their access management regulations. That's really when they implemented it. So for the fear that Ca Powhatan County is gonna look like Chesterfield, that's simply not true. Uh, the reality is the reason being is they redid all of their access <coughs> management standards to prohibit what they have in parts of Chesterfield County. Um, the traffic impacts analysis as staff iterated, we will get that. That will be done with the rezoning. For instance, the double turn lanes that are turning into Walmart was a proffer that had nothing to do with our access management standards. It was a proffer. Um, 2004, the Planning Commission, you know, implemented the access management standards. And one of the big issues is the spacing requirements from 495 to 625. The 625, no one knows where the number came from. We still don't know where the number came from. There's been some thoughts, rumors that it came from the American Association of Traffic and Safety Engineers, but the data doesn't show exactly where that number precipitated from. Um, as far as preserving our roads, preserving safety, I'd like to ask a question to my fellow board members. What criteria do we use in granting a waiver? And where is that criteria listed anywhere in any ordinance plan? Do we have any criteria? So, well, I'll, I'll respond, Mrs. Carmack, if that's a question to the board. Yes, where is the criteria? There isn't any criteria. And that's part of the problem why <clears throat> we took the waivers uh, away from staff. We said we had to approve them. And now we're approving them with VDOT at the table, discussing them with them. If you notice any time I've done this, I've said, I wanna know what VDOT says, okay? Because every situ situation is nuanced by the type of development. If we're asking what VDOT says, why don't we use their standards? Um, so, that being is, is said, that a question I, for the no, board? that's just a statement. It's a rhetorical question. It concerns me that we have no, as I said earlier, we have no criteria when evaluating a waiver and it's done on a whim. If we like the project, we waive it. If we don't, we don't waive it. There's no quantitative analysis illustrating the 625 feet is more effective or safer than the 495. Um, and no one can point to exactly what purpose they serve and why we have them other than the planning commission put them in place in 2004 and the planning commission last time i checked does not have a pe degree next to each of their you know names to me it's another layer of bureaucracy that serves no purpose thank you mr chair mr chairman yes mr williams And granting these waivers, we've had times in this county where we didn't always know that there was a waiver being granted. Now, we don't have criteria for VDOT when they do a waiver. 
and they do waver us, as we know. Um, going back to the Planning Commission, I can tell you the sources at that time. It was the Institute of Traffic Engineers and ASHTU, which is an acronym, the American Association of Traffic Engineers and something else. That was in, that's in the old subdivision ordinance. So there was something it was tied to back then. Uh, I don't know what the Institute of Traffic Engineers says today. Um, but I've always appreciated the fact when somebody had to come in and they said, well, it doesn't meet the standard, then I get to develop the issue more thoroughly and I'd be able to discuss it and make a better decision as opposed to just automatically going to a lesser standard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cox. Could um, we put up classic granite? Uh, first, I haven't heard the problem with our access management standards yet. Um, so until I hear real problems, uh, it's a solution in search of a problem. This is classic granite. Uh, right up where it says Route 60, you see that little turn lane that's coming. If you're on westbound 60, that would be a turn lane to your left into classic granite. It is not approved. It's part of the, this is part of the conceptual plan. That turn lane meets VDOT standards. It does not meet our standards. And so the question becomes, do you approve it or not? And this is Carmack wanted to know, you know, what criteria do you use? Well, I wanna know since as you're looking up there to the right side, would be going back to Page Road and County Line Road. You see where the corner is, it is pretty close to where that uh, cutover is. How much storage is there for large semi trucks before they begin to impede the prop, the prop, the uh, intersection at Page Road? So if we pass this ordinance, they can put it in by VDOT standards. If under our old rules, they have to come to us. We get to evaluate what we know about our traffic, our neighborhoods, and make a decision whether it makes sense or not. I don't see that as a problem. I don't see that as discriminatory. Discriminatory. I don't see that as uh, being anything other than practical. So there are all kinds of nuances to this, not all of which are obvious. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> I hear, Ms. Carmack, what you say about new standards for VDOT, but short pump 360 are the showcases for traffic that we're looking to have in Powhatan County. And we've got to keep the traffic moving. We are a commuter community. More entrances onto 60, and there won't be many more, as you saw. It doesn't, you know, doesn't affect many pieces of property. So why are we doing this? I have yet to hear any compelling reasons why it makes any sense to change what has been working for us. It hadn't hurt us. And I think it helps us in the long term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ms. Carmack. Second time again, if somebody comes in for a rezoning, what do they have to do? A traffic impact analysis. If they do a traffic impact analysis and we find that there is improvements that are needed on 60, what can we ask for? A proffer, something to mitigate, offset the issue. It's so it's not like we get rid of these standards and we have no say-so authority. That's, that's simply not true. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Cox. Um, in, in terms of Mrs. Carmack's motion, uh, I'm confused because mm -hmm. staff hasn't given you a complete motion to deal with. They have left the whole TIA section in Goochland County all up in the air. We don't, that's an unknown piece. I just saw the Goochland piece for the very first time. So we, I don't like what the planning commission said, which is a TIA on everything. I, I, okay. So I don't, I can't vote tonight on what the TIA requirements are going to be because we don't have them. We haven't talked about them and they weren't in a package. So I, I, you know, so I, I have some confusion about what really we would be voting on re reference to the TIA side. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you remember your motion? Yes. Okay. My motion is basically to revert our county standards to our current county access management standards to VDOT standards. The, the TIA has, there's nothing in that regarding the TIA. I, I didn't think there was. Yeah, the, there, so the, the okay. planning commission sent up a recommendation. That was I, it. I, I got your motion. Yeah. Mr. McClung second the motion. Mm -hmm. Let's have a roll call vote. Mr. Williams. No. Mr. McClung. Yay. Mr. Cox. No. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Barley. Aye. Motion carries three to two. We will revert the VDOT standards. And by the way, thank you, VDOT, for being in the audience tonight. You've waited very patiently, and I appreciate it very much. We all do. Um, see, um, this is uh, 020 07 case 21 10 uh, rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is for uh, rezoning ordinance uh, request for DJM Ventures in District 2. Request rezoning of tax map parcel 42-82D from A10 to Commerce Center and requires a public hearing. Mr. Hopkins, please update us on the ordinance. Yep. So this is a rezoning request. You'll recall at the general commercial uh, to CC rezoning. We did every building in the growth areas, every parcel in the growth areas in general commercial. The structures on them. This is a companion case. The original uh, rezoning had that case inside of it. Do you have the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, so really it's just for the adjacent parcel. And the reason being is really for the access portion of the lot. Um, here you can see an overview of the lot. Um, as the access goes to the adjacent parcel, which is the one in question tonight, the borders Irvine Road to the west, um, comes through an A10 parcel as part of our ordinance, that property line that's running there has to have a type B buffer um, against the other parcel under co common ownership. So anytime that a commercial parcel is bordering an A10 parcel, you have to have a type B buffer. Well, if you did that in this case, uh, it would basically eat up the only area in which the access could come out to Irvine Road. If you will recall, um, I spoke at the prior planning or planning or board meeting um, in that larger rezoning about this case specifically. And we, we tried to vet going through the east to the O'Reilly's property um, in trying to figure that out. Uh, if you've been out there, there's a big grade uh, and O'Reilly's is gonna end up leveling out. So the cost is gonna be cost primitive really for anybody to build out to come up that way, especially for a small restaurant. So realistically, it's gonna have to come out Irvine Road. They're gonna close their 60 entrance, which is proffered as part of this case. Um, and this is about the Western parcel here only to go to CC. And I can tell you again, if you've been out there, it is an undevelopable parcel. It is basically swampland. Um, there is a stream running through it and they plan to put a BMP in there as well. Uh, but really we'd like to just have this site plan essentially cleaned up, possibly move the property line or at least free them up from not having to put in a buffer that would eat up their access. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. We'll open up the public hearing now. Or actually, if the applicant would like to have anything they want to say. Thank you for letting us come up or me come up. Yes, um, when we bought this property in 2016, it was all commercial. And it was set aside, which we've been keeping up since then. Um, and probably as you all know, because we have, as we call it our dream. Um, and 
at the time they were both commercial. And then in 2018, which we had no idea, they were turned to agriculture. Um, the one property that we're talking about right now, as Frank said, is we never even imagined even doing anything with. It was, came with that property. Um, and we didn't realize too, that the driveway going in the back goes with what you've now called agricultural. So we have our plans drawn up, we have our dream, but we don't know how to get into it, which is our property. And we just wanna be able to, I guess, I, I don't understand how we can have a driveway on a property that we already own. And I understand all the, the rules and stuff, but I mean, it's our property. So all we wanna do is have 15 feet to drive in. We're not doing any commercial anything on that corner lot. Um, and if the county ever wants to do anything with it, we would gladly let you do something with it because we're not doing anything with it. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Now we'll open up for the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to make a comment on this? Stephen Barrow, 3492, Richards Run, District 3. Uh, I know the applicants personally, they're great people. They run some good restaurants around town. Uh, at the hearing when she said, I think y'all need to help them out. I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, they bought it. Things have changed since they bought it. Uh, as long as you got enough of a turn lane there, whatever you need, so you don't have any access. Irvine doesn't have but so much traffic on there. Now, granted, it can possibly increase down the road. I know that. But uh, I think, you know, it'd be a good addition to the community. Uh, that's a small business there that we could use. So please consider approving it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public? Anyone on Zoom, Mr. Smither? Zoom is clear, Mr. Chair. Mr. Okay. Chair. Not seeing anyone else from the public. Um, we'll close the public comment period. Uh, now it's to the board. Yes, Mr. McClellan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, sir. In accordance with Article 2 of the Powhatan County Zoning Ordinance and Public Necessity, Convenience, General Welfare, and Good Zoning Practice, the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors recommends approval of the request submitted by DJM Ventures to rezone tax map parcel 401-820 with proffered conditions. I'll second that. Comments, questions, board members? Ms. Barley. Yes, sir, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, if I understand it on page 91, that's a conceptual plan what I just from, the, from the prior, is that correct? Correct. And it shows the entrance coming through this property. Correct. Uh, and the use is to be a restaurant, is that correct? Correct. Um, Can we, how do you have a commercial entrance that's 24 feet wide? You can't do that, can you? Mr. Chardin knows. That's what it's just what it shows. See this, the, that's the, the drive aisle width. The uh, the actual throw to the entrance itself would have to be a commercial spec, which would be meet feet out requirements. So that's just showing the, the actual drive aisles themselves, which would be 12 and 12. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, have, there's no feed out information on Irvine Road. All the information is over on 60, which is being closed and going to understand sure. it. So why don't we have any, unfortunately they just left. Uh, why don't we have any VDOT information on Irvine Road? Sure, um, to be perfectly honest with you, that would be my error probably early on when I took this case months ago. I didn't know the TIA was a requirement. Um, now, Mr. Lackney 
has issued a legal opinion about the use of the building. Would you like to take us through that? I think the building can be used has been the historical practice of our department that it could be used. I asked about Mr. Lackney's opinion. Sure. Could, uh, let me ask a question, Mr. Cox. Does this line of questioning where you're going have anything to do with the rezoning of 41-82D? Mr. Barley, at our discussion at our last meeting, we said we could put any proffers on this that we wanted to. Okay. okay. And so one of the proffers that you could put on this is that the building could not be used for restaurants. So we need to find the facts of the case. That's all I'm trying to do. Okay, Mr. Cox. So there is a direct correlation. Okay. So Mr. Hopkins, uh, Holly, could you put up, I think it's called LACNI. This is the legal opinion from our county attorney dated in January. Uh, Mr. Lackney, this is this is yours. Could you give us this? I, I don't think we need to read it all. Could you give us a summation of what what it, what your opinion was? Yeah, it's we have we have a section in our code on non-conforming uses and non-conforming structures. This this particular structure doesn't meet our current setbacks. And under county code, if you abandon a, a non-conforming use for more than two years, you can't restart it. Um, there's, a, there's case law out there that says whether it's the use of the building, use of the property, use of the, it, it's all rolled into one under state code with, under vested rights. There's no, you don't have any vested right if you abandon a non-conforming use. And so my opinion is and continues to be that since it's been abandoned for well over two years and it was abandoned at the time that the purchaser purchased it, it can't be revived now as a, as a lawful use. So in a practical matter, as we go forward, what happens? Well, technically the use of the building would be at the development stage and not at the rezoning stage. Although you, as you mentioned, you could ask for a proffer, but technically whether the building can or cannot be used isn't a zoning question. It's a, it's a development question, which comes after a rezoning. But it's, you have a legal opinion that we can't use this. And so, are you telling me that Mr. Hopkins can redefine what our ordinances are? No, I'm telling you the zoning administrator has the final authority to determine whether something is conforming or non-conforming and to grant vested rights that that is statutorily delegated to the zoning administrator. How does that, I'm, I'm, I understand that, but you've issued a legal opinion. Help me marry the two together. Well, as, Pretty, pro pretty much everybody on the board's probably had the, at some point, hey, it's just your opinion. And you know, it is a legal opinion. And he, the attorney general himself says, it's just my opinion. And, and I don't have any enforcement power. I don't have anything to make anybody follow my opinions. I just give opinions. Um, if you're a citizen and you're not following an ordinance in the county, and, and uh, there's a complaint, what happens? We, 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 we investigate it and, and we enforce our ordinances, right? Um, most of the time, not always. Okay, but well, we try to. Yeah, okay. not, not always. It's, it's a case that's case specific. So we have a situation where uh, Mr. Hopkins allows the use of the building for a restaurant and we got a legal opinion from you. What, what, is, what is the remedy? Well, the, the remedy, if there is one, if you want to call it a remedy, neighbors could theoretically file a suit within the statutory time period and challenge the finding by Mr. Hopkins and say it was illegal. So we would be suing ourselves? No, no, neighbor, a neighboring property owner. So anybody can, anybody can do that, right? Yes. Okay. So I, I, I just find this... Uh, beyond comprehension that we are deciding how uh, to define at the staff level what our ordinances are. Thank just so it's can not- you, can, can you help me? Um, yeah, yeah, so- <laughs> Thank you. Um, and also just so it's not, uh, to give some context and some history to it, it's not just Mr. Hopkins' interpretation. This has historically been the way we've interpreted this section of the non-conforming 
code, as you'll recall, we approved three crosses of ceiling. That's within the setback of Route 13. Um, we approved a uh, license agreement to allow Four Seasons Restaurant to build uh, additional onto their property within the Route 13 setback. So in both of those cases, we looked at them. Uh, we looked at our code section that says when you have non-conforming structure, you can expand it so long as you don't come closer to the road. You can essentially draw a line along the front and build to the back of that. Um, when I was uh, in this position of zoning administrator, um, I, I would have interpreted it the same way as Mr. Hopkins. I uh, reached out to our prior uh, planning director and also zoning administrator, Mr. Pompage, to say, with this situation, you know, you're in the seat, how have you interpreted it? He would have interpreted it the same way as Mr. Hopkins and I. Um, then I looked back and found some cases, uh, I believe it was Millet Fine Creek many years ago, got a conditional use permit for non-conforming expansion. In that staff report, the planning director at the time, I don't recall who it was, this was, you know, 10 years ago, probably. In the staff report, they said uh, Powhatan Planning Department has consistently interpreted that you can build uh, along a non-conforming structure so long as you don't build closer to the road. So again, this isn't, this might be the first time, um, you know, we've really dug into one recently on this, but it's consistently, we as staff have interpreted this section this way. Um, I would say if the board doesn't like that interpretation, we, we need to amend our zoning ordinance because there is a section that says, you know, essentially just that, that when you have a non-conforming structure, so long as you're not coming closer to the road or increasing the non-conformity, you can do so, you can you can build onto the back or sides of it. Um, so again, you know, that's kind of a policy decision for the board. If you don't like that, we can amend the zoning ordinance to do so. Um, but again, I just wanted to provide some context that this is, is consistent with how uh, prior zoning administrators have interpreted um, similar situations. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. Brad, come on back up. Yes. If you found out that you've been filing your taxes wrong for the last five years, would you keep filing them wrong this year? It, I would not see that as an analogous comment, uh, comparison. Um, because I, I believe we are following the ordinance uh, correctly. Again, if we don't like what the ordinance is creating, then we need to amend the ordinance. But it, it has a section that very clearly says you can do just that. And that's how it's been interpreted. And again, we've had cases that have come before the board, uh, four seasons and three crosses, and it was never brought up as an issue then. Um, but if we want to change it, we certainly can. You know, I, I respect Mr. Lackney's opinion. Um, you know, we non-conforming zoning law in Virginia is a very complex and nuanced issue. So um, I can see his interpretation of it, but uh, I believe ours is, is correct according to our zoning ordinance is currently written. But um, I would agree with him that if the board so chooses to change it, you absolutely legally can restrict them in such a way as he's talked about. But again, that's, that's not how I read or interpret the ordinance today and not how it's been interpreted by staff uh, in years. So we would have to include everything Tom said about if it had been abandoned for more than two years, then you can come back with the same use and use you know, the same. same. So that the, when dealing with the use of the building, that's currently in there. So I think, and that's where, that's the one part of it that, that we just disagree on is the, the where use and structure differentiate. So our ordinance does say a use of a building um, if, abandoned for two years can't be continued unless it's in accordance with the zoning ordinance. So if um, that's kind of what we undid uh, last month or the month before with the proactive rezoning to CC. So if you had a building that was operating a daycare center and see general commercial zoning, for example, we took that use out. And now you have it, you can continue it as a non-conforming use. If they abandon it for two years, you could not then restart that use in the building without rezoning to CC or something like that. But that's the the use happening inside the building. We have a separate specific section that deals with structures and non-conforming structures. And that's where it says you can expand them uh, so long as it uh, is not increasing the non-conformity. Um, as far as the use, them proposing uh, to rezone to CC would address the use issue on this part of the property. That was addressed on the, the actual subject restaurant property last month or whenever it was that the board proactively rezoned the, the C parcel. So the use part of it is okay. Now we're just talking about structure nonconformity. What I don't want to do is to give people the impression that if the planning director, you know, says in his opinion and meets the spirit, then you're going to be okay. I don't. I don't want to get 
I know you don't want that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think y'all, either one of you, want that. No, I, I, I think you want things spelled out. You're the keeper of the rules. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to give the people in the audience the impression that we will do things one way for one applicant and not do it for other applicants. Correct. Now, I would say just, just the opposite. It's to me spelled out very clearly in the ordinance. So we're not making a stretch interpretation or talking about spirit of the ordinance. We're, we're applying it as it's written word for word, and we're not doing anything different for them. Again, this is, this is how it's been consistently interpreted over the years. Well, it needs to be fixed if we want to change it. Um, yeah, but, I, but I am concerned about Mr. Lackney's response that somebody could sue us. Do you concur with that? Well, I mean, somebody could always file a, a oh, yeah, suit. I know, I know like, but you, this is a rezoning and you know how that works. Sure. sure <laughs> you, yeah. you know what uh, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, you know, in looking at the case law dealing with non-conforming, there has been some, um, you know, lawsuits over the years, uh, developing case law. And I remember one, I don't remember the actual, uh, uh, which the case was, I could look it up, but it says when dealing with non-conforming structures and their expansion, there should be great deference given to how that statute's been interpreted in the past by staff. So again, even the courts recognize kind of that issue that the county should be consistent. So um, I wouldn't expect a legal challenge on this if it did. Again, I believe we're interpreting it correctly. And then also we're in line with what the courts have upheld that you should be consistent we're, we're being consistent. So um, one other thing I'll add too, you know, we, we always have to worry about what we do it's not just one parcel, one building, but what are the consequences for, for other parcels? So uh, we looked and to see if there were other similar parcels with buildings close to Route 60. Um, I, I was surprised to find so few. I thought there would be more, but actually it's deceptive. Most of them are actually well outside of the setback. So again, if you don't like how this section of the ordinance is written, we certainly need to amend it. But if we keep it, Again, we've consistently interpreted this way, and I don't see a, a flurry of dozens of buildings all expanding along Route 60. Again, this one's um, fairly unique in that regard. All right, let me move to another question. Um, parking spaces. I remember when Mr. Sowers came in with his apartments, y'all counted parking spaces to see if it was the requisite number based on the number of units and the type of units. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. How many parking spaces will this use require? Do you recall offhand? Yeah, we, we you know, we'd probably look at that at the, the site plan stage. Mr. Sauer's project was a little different in just the massive amount of parking I think it would generate. Um, this being a smaller one, we would typically look at that at site plan. Um, we could, we could pull up the ordinance and see what the generation is for restaurant. I don't recall offhand. Okay, because right now you're showing, I think, 20 some. Yeah, and that, that came up at Planning Commission, I believe, the first time when they looked at it and the applicant, um, you know, said they, they could adjust that when we get to site plan, depending on um, the deeds, but they felt again, they operate a few of these, they felt that it would be adequate for the demand they'd expect at this restaurant. And again, when we go through the site plan, it will meet our ordinance requirement. What about the park that they're proposing to put in with it? Does that have a, a chip generation, a trip generation factor associated with that? The park? The, I, I've got a question here. Okay, did I miss, did I miss something? I, we're rezoning this parcel. And we're not talking about a development, are we? No. And that's, are we talking about developing this, this no. property? Either, I mean, there's two parcels here. We're only talking about, the way I read this, the rezoning of 41-82D. I mean, they may make this uh, a gym, as far as I know. They may make it a restaurant. They may put a church there. I don't know what they're going to put there. Um, but I know that the, the property's been rezoned, and now we're, we're trying to rezone this parcel. And that's all I'm saying, Mr. Williams. I, know, I think you're on a, a good track. Don't get me wrong. No, no. I, 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 if I misspoke, I apologize. But um, I thought I read somewhere in the staff report that I did. Yeah. So in my initial conversation with them, we talked about um, preserving green space and also potentially having a space for children to play. So I condense that into a proper to make a park or a preserved space, green space, at least on the property for that. Is, is the park going to be something that people are going to access separate from going to the restaurant? No, 
That was my question. No. Okay. Thank you, John. Mr. Chair, I made a motion. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Here. Williams, for your, <laughs> your comments and questions. Yes, Mr. McClung. I made a motion. Yep. It's been seconded. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cox. Mr. Lackney, if you'd help me. Uh, you've listened to um, Mr. Chardine. Um, explanation. Has any of that changed uh, how you view this? Not, not at all. Thank you. Good. Let's have a roll call vote, Mr. Smith. Mr. Williams. No. Mr. McClung. Yes. Mr. Cox. No. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Barley. Aye. Motion passes three to two. Next up, ordinance 02022-06, Powhatan County. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Ordinance 02022-06 requests a change in the social services board from an administrative board to an advisory board pursuant to Virginia Code 63.2-302. Mr. Chairman, this action requires a public hearing. Okay, the floor is open for the public hearing. Jacqueline Anderson, 3342 Pine Acre Drive. Um, I sit on an advisory board for the school system, and frankly, it's a, it's a dog and pony show. We are advised on what the school administration wants us to know, but we are not asked to give advice on anything. It's a one-way street. And I would hate to see that happen to our social services board. No one denies that the previous board dropped the ball on some important decisions and issues. However, you have just appointed two highly competent individuals. Allow them to work with the rest of the board and the new director for the good of Powhatan. This ordinance states that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors desires to replace the current local board with an appointed government official. It boils down to, do you believe in limited government or not? If you do, why would you vote to take control from a group of citizens, a group of Powhatan citizens, and give control to an individual government official who might not even be a resident of the county? I ask that you remember the words of Ronald Reagan, who said, quote, the most terrifying words in English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, end quote. Please vote no on this measure. Thank you. David Barrow, 3492, Richards Run, District 3. Uh, heard a woman talk about the ball got dropped. Got dropped a whole lot of ways. Board, people we got representing us up there on the thing. Uh, I have to agree. Why do we want to take it out of the citizens of this county? Put it in control of a non elected official. I mean, I'm sorry. All I hear is that county administrator is overloaded. Now we're going to put, throw another load on the mule. Well, if we do that, then we're going to hire another person to take care of that. And that's more expense. They had opportunity to take care of some problems about taxes. And all we keep doing is adding more, adding more people to the payroll, building an empire. I'll tell you one thing, you keep building an empire for some of these people around here, you're going to regret it. You got citizens trying to do a good job to give them the time free. But yet we want to give it to somebody else in government to run it for us to tell us how to do it. Well, how's that been working out for us here lately? Not too good, I don't think. Maybe I'm just not real happy with government. So the average person in this country and average person in this county is getting really fed up with government big time. So think before you act. I know what we say starting to look like doesn't really matter. I hate to say that. I had high hopes for this board, but like everything in life, sometimes you, your hopes get rained on or other words, I can't say that would be inappropriate in a meeting like this. 
So please think before y'all act and vote and have faith in the citizens, at least on this issue. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Anyone on Zoom, Mr. Smith? Zoom is clear, Mr. Chair. We're going to close the public hearing. Uh, board members, comments? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to make Mr. a motion. Mike. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to move that we approve Ordinance 0 2022 06. Okay. Have a second. Second. Okay, Mr. McClung. Floor is open for comments, questions. Question for a representative on the social services board. Why are we doing this? Uh, Holly, can you pull up my presentation? I think this will offer a little clarity. So I've served on the social service board for two years now. Uh, currently, and basically it's not running as efficiently as it could. Uh, we are currently an administrative board. There's two types you can have per state code, an administrative or an advisory. We're currently operating as an administrative. And if you read, I said I would never do this, one of these PowerPoints with these all these bullet points, but unfortunately, this is what comes straight out of state code. So the administrative board functions, if you see, are pretty um, robust. They are, should be preparing budgets and reports to state and local officials, employment of legal counsel and civil matters. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, placement of adult protective services, placement of children and adults in foster homes or other facilities where appropriate. So currently we have not been operating at all as an administrative board. Um, can you go to the next slide? Advisory role functions. Uh, we have been operating more as an advisory role from what I have witnessed over two years. And candidly, we haven't been doing that very well. Um, if you, you know, I'll give you a second to read some of these um, bullet points. Meet with your local government officials who constitutes the local board at least four times per year monitor the formulation and implementation of the social service program by the local department. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, create and implement policy and community outreach that is agreed upon by the social service board, executive director and county administrator. It's a much more uh, appropriate role for the citizen makeup. And, if, and here's why I say that after what I've witnessed, witnessed. Um, communication and accountability. The social service board has similar authority to the board of supervisors and school board. However, there's no voter or citizen accountability. They have as much they have as much rights as us as a board of supervisors or a school board, yet they have no oversight. They have no citizen accountability, no oversight whatsoever. They're responsible for the third, third largest budget in the county, 29 employees, 4.3 million. They have no bylaws. How should the meetings be run? How many meetings can a board member miss? Do they have a remote policy, a Zoom policy, transparency? They have no video, no audio of board meetings or any sort of public accountability. Um, so there's definitely been an ineffective communication between social, social service board, social service staff and county staff. There's been discrepancies in appointment dates. We've witnessed that uh, ourselves the past month. In fact, we just, I can iterate this again. We just appointed um, two new members and we got it received an email from one of the new members. <clears throat> and she said, I was told I am on this board, but what do I do? Where do I go? In other words, okay, is it the social service executive director? Is it Mr. Smither? No. Is it me as the social service board member? Is it the chairman of the social service board? There's no criteria of any of that, of a leadership hierarchy. Um, we need a better understanding of roles and responsibilities. I had, in fact, one of the uh, social service board members ask me, you know, why she didn't know more about her roles and responsibilities at the last board meeting. I couldn't answer her. 
I don't know why you don't know more about your roles and responsibilities. There's a lag time between meetings that can cause disruption and flow of communication. Next. So, and I want to point out the board historical engagement since uh, 2019 through 2021. Only three of the 19 meetings had all five voting board members present. Um, the board member number one, he was he missed seven of 19. Board member number two, six of 19. Board member number three, absent nine of 19. Board member number four, absent zero. His term began October 2020. Board member number five, absent two of 19. So a couple of them, you know, definitely made a priority of coming to the meetings. Next page. The current board status, board member one appointed just a few weeks ago, board member number two appointed a few weeks ago, board member, num board member number three term ends in August of 2022, board member number four term ends September 2022, board member number five just resigned, so there's another opening. And my point of put bringing the current board member status up is you have a board that technically should be overseeing placing children in foster care, placing children or adults in adult protective services, overseeing a $4.3 million budget, doing performance analysis uh, policy, and we can't ensure that they're gonna show up at the meeting. Next slide. Um, I did poll the department heads and social services, which nobody had asked before, what does their staff want? Uh, four out of the five recommended and supported moving from administrative to advisory board. Uh, it would have improved accountability to the citizens of Powhatan, improved communication and transparency, and overall improved budgetary oversight by us, the elected officials. So that's why. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. Mr. Carmack, thank you for that overview. Uh, very helpful. What happens when you get appointed to the social services board? You should technically go for state training within 90 days, which the state training is pretty weak. I think if you ask any, there's a social service board member out there and she would agree the, the state training is not, not very, very good. Do we do that? The board members, yeah, they do go to the state training. Okay. Yeah, they have to. Okay. They, and they, it, it, let me answer one thing, Mr. Williams. The state training is the same for advisory or administrative. There's no different training for either either board. Okay. Because I, I, I'd heard that it wasn't replete. So, in your two years working in social services, what kind of communication, what kind of assistance and guidance did you get from the director? Uh, I had a good relationship with the director. I reached out to her fairly often. Well, what about in terms of the way that she mentored her board? Because obviously when you get into all these different um, service delivery programs that they have in social service and there are many and they're complicated and we know they're expensive. I couldn't tell you what they are, but I can tell you serving on a board, I know what kind of questions to ask. What was the communication in terms of mentoring that board that you were receiving from the social services director to help y'all understand as a board what your role was, and what reports were you getting? She required the members. I came in after most of these members had been on for two years, so I can't speak to what kind of training no, they received. No, I'm talking received. about your two years. Yeah, my two years. Um, I We reviewed the financials. That was pretty much what we reviewed. We reviewed the financials. We would get the monthly financial statement, review it, looks good check it off and moved on. So you were just, you know, one of my biggest gripes is don't, and don't expect me to go to meetings where nothing's getting done. Nobody, nobody has any ambition to go and do that. 
Did you get quarterly reports from the state in terms of how well the department was doing in Powhatan County in terms of was it meeting its performance objectives or performance standards? No. You should have. And those, those, those quarterly reports should have been shared with the board. And the board, if they saw those quarterly reports, would see that we weren't meeting the indicators. For example, completing things at a certain you know, percentage. We're in the red. You know, when this whole thing came up, I went out there and looked and you know, started seeing, okay, what is going on in Powhatan County? How well are we doing our job? But y'all never got anything, did you? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, two, two points. First, the board members are oversee the executive director. It, it's like us with Mr. Smither. If we're not happy that we're not getting a report, it's upon us to ask him for that report. That, that's, that's the kind of board we have set up right now. The fact that if she did give the reports, didn't give the reports, that's not on her, that's on the board. Secondly, the numbers that you indicate that you know we're in the red, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer and it's a little bit of a false uh, accusations for lack of a better way of speaking. And I can't speak very fluidly to that, but with the size of our jurisdiction, with the criteria we have, a lot of times we will be in the red. That doesn't mean we're not meeting criteria. And there is somebody here from social <laughs> services. I don't know if, if we could call on her, if it would give you some sense of assurance of what these numbers mean, as opposed to just saying that we're not meeting performance standards. Well, we, can, we can come back to that, but you know, it would be helpful if, you know, if we had the reports for the last two years and pass them out among the board members and Everybody could see what I'm talking about, you know, where we're, where we're meeting and where they've got in red and how we're doing comparing to other localities. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Mr. Latchney? But let, let me finish. I'm not through yet. So you come on a board, you expect to have, you know, the director mentoring the board, I would hope but that wasn't going on. Moreover, you know, when we had people coming off the board, we weren't even notified as a board of supervisors, never told. And that we had Mr. Burnett who left, I believe in August of 2021. We didn't get notified about a vacancy under upcoming appointments to boards and commissions. Then I looked at the minutes. The minutes said, you know, the former director said, well, we're going to have two vacancies because one of the members goes off at the end of December. Well, that's two. But yet we were never told to advertise for replacement for those people. And yet we had, you know, you as our representative on the board to come back and just share that information. I'll go back to the person that we were told, or excuse me, was referred to in the minutes. That person wasn't scheduled to come off. We only found out later that person shouldn't have come off, that really they had months to continue, but that came out later. So even as recently as December, I talked to Brett and Brett had information from the director that said the composition of social services was you, um, and the two members of the CPMT team. Former director advised Rutt that 
we those were the only three that we were responsible for that social services took care of the other two appointments. That wasn't true. Then later, you know, adding to the confusion, it was communicated again to Mr. Stout. This was February 14th because my representative called me because he was told through you that you and he were the only two members on the board. That also turned out not to be true. So then we found out that Mr. Smith wasn't coming off till the end of February. The other two members didn't come off till August or September. Now, all this time we've had staff here in the county tracking the appointments. We've had at least four different individuals I know work on that. As recently as the last meeting, I had the assistant county administrator working on that. And that's just count, you know, tracking who goes on the board and who comes off. And those are four year appointments. They shouldn't be that hard, but we seem to can't get that right. Something that fundamental. So we went six months, a half a year without knowing that there were vacancies. And it was not until two weeks before the meeting in February was it advertised on Facebook that we needed to fill positions to places. That's never happened before. So if I have a concern about all of this, you know, Boards, let me tell you something. When you come in, you expect to be able to be, have in-service training to better understand and to be mentored. And everything I'm seeing right now about moving from administrative to advisory, I have no confidence that it's gonna solve any problem because people are the critical difference. And right now we're not doing a very good job on the county side, just keeping track of the appointments. So when you get into this thing about, we're now gonna to move to, you know, the county's gonna take it over. Well, somebody's still gotta know about the programs. Somebody's gotta still know about, you know, how well we're doing. Somebody's gonna to have to know something to be able to do that job. That's, that's my concern. Thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. Any other board members comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cox, would you like to say something? Mr. McClung? No. Ms. Carmack? Um, you're right, there needs to be oversight, but historically there has been no oversight. That was what I tried to illustrate in my PowerPoint. We have had a communication lapse. There has been ineffective communication. There is no doubt about that. That is not to be debatable. And the email that you reference, Mr. Williams, was one that was strictly between Mr. Shardine and myself. And I didn't share that with anybody because I knew the information was incorrect. And candidly, you got that information, that email, and you subsequently shared it with everybody when that, in fact, information was not correct in that email. So I just want to make point that out for clarification. One last thing, if we remain as an administrative board, those reports that you want to see do not have to come to us. Am I correct in that, Mr. Latchney? I've got no opinion on this matter. Oh, that's right. I <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's all. Okay. I, no. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Cox. Um, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Carmack, you're our representative on the board, and you said those reports wouldn't have to come to us. 
you could give them to us, could you not? I could. Okay. That just, I mean, so the information mm -hmm. is available. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, it's pretty interesting uh, description by Mrs. Carmack of things not going well and things that need to be in a, a, a different world, if you will. Uh, my conundrum is I don't see your alternative as improving anything. The solution that you give us, it's the only other solution you have, I understand that, okay? Uh, I don't see that. I have no faith that that's going to help uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so I can tell you all right now, I don't find either choice attractive. Uh, and so I will be, when we go to vote, I'm going to be abstaining because I, I won't support either one of them. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may comment. Sure. I agree with Mr. Cox. I, I think it sums it up very well. Uh, I think Ms. Carmack did a good job of putting up on the screen the differences. I think that was very useful. What, I, what I'm perplexed about is just like Mr. Cox. I don't know what the solution is at this moment tonight in taking action and moving it over to the county. That's, that's the problem that I have. But anyway, that's my comments. Just my bottle. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, I'll be very brief. Thank you. <laughs> very brief. I think Mr. Williams solidified my vote to make the change of everything that he said that this board should be receiving from them. Uh, it sort of leads me to that path that we should. Um, so thank you for helping me make my decision to, to vote for the uh, <clears throat> advisory board. I'm here to the, serve, Mr. Chairman. The, the, uh, I think that's what we're all here for. We, we have to vote in order to serve. And the uh, director does work for the board up to this moment. Till we take a vote, the director works for the board. So let's have a roll call vote, Mr. Smither. Mr. Williams. Abstain. Mr. McClung. Aye. Ms. Cox. I abstain. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Barley. I'm gonna serve and vote, aye. Next up, case 02022-08, uh, case 2201, the CUP, Mr. Williams District, Terry Hawk, or how, maybe I didn't say that correct, I apologize. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Hopkins, get, lead us on. Yeah. Which is not a use you guys probably get too much of. Against the District 1, fairly large parcel, 132 acres, zoned A10. Again, it is for a country inn. So what is that? Here's the definition of it. Um, it goes up to 50 guests or 20 rooms. The house in question here only has four rooms and is conditioned to have eight overnight guests and any um, accompanying children, which is fairly consistent with a lot of Airbnb regs throughout the state. Um, the Planning Commission, there was some confusion at the Planning Commission level about what was being requested and asked for. They wanted to make sure that no public came to the property. In my conversations with the applicant, that is not what she wants. Uh, her letter very clearly states that she would like to have a small farm stand and a tea room as a part of the application. So why classifying her as a country in? It's because she wants to do the tea in addition to the lodging. And that's what this definition provides. The one issue I think that comes of this is how do you control the amount of public that gets there? And so we talked about possibly if you'd have reservations or whatnot. Um, we've arrived at basically if you go over 50 people, which is the definition here. And also she's part of a Virginia uh, Outdoor Foundation easement that would violate both of those things. So it'll be basically subject to a zoning violation if she goes over that and have your CUP revoked. This is the house in question where the lodging would take place. Uh, it has currently been used as an Airbnb. I've received no complaints on it. Here is the property. You can see that what is going to be turned into the tea house in the distance. Again, a very large parcel. Here is again a close up of that tea house with a group of people there and a group of people around the main house. 
The other condition that was added at the planning commission level was consistent with all of our rural event venues, and that is to control the outdoor sound and amplification. So if that's a concern, that is in the conditions. Um, she's already upgraded her septic system to accept increasing numbers of people. Um, and the exit onto, um, oh gosh, it's escaped my mind, Springs Road. Huguenot, Huguenot Springs. Springs Road. Uh, it currently has a Y shape. VDOT does not like that. It needs to be condensed into commercial entrance that is at at least a 60 degree angle to the road. All of that has been vetted. Um, I will take questions if you have public comment period. The applicant like to make a statement? Just one small point of clarification. Um, the room, uh, the house has four bedrooms. Yes, yes so not I'm rooms, that's okay. Uh, and that's all I'm planning to use in terms of overnight accommodations. Um, and Mr. Hopkins pretty much covered everything and I know you guys are tired, so I'm not gonna say a lot, um, but I just wanna say I'm the last member of my family family to live on Terre Haute. It's been in my family about 200 years. I have no heirs to leave it to, so I would like to leave it in as self-sustainable a condition as I can financially and environmentally, which is why we have the outdoor foundation easement on it. Um, I would like to eventually create or leave it to a nonprofit for the county and for future generations to enjoy. Um, as far as any kind of impact on Huguenot Springs is concerned, it should not. I noticed in the uh, county comprehensive plan that there is a plan to widen and straighten and realign intersections on Huguenot Springs Road, but I don't know when that's going to happen, and I'm sure you don't either. But um, yeah, and, and I just in closing will say throughout its history, uh, the farm was a post office, it was a general store for the community where they sold baked goods and things my great grandmother and grandmother did. So this is really just in keeping with what it's already been for many, many years. So that's it. Thank you, ma'am. We'll open up the public hearing. Anyone from the public wish to speak? Hi again, I'm still here. Hi. I'm Betty McCracken. I live at 3, 3918 Howell Road in Powhatan. And I have a letter in your packet uh, that I was able to put in there earlier for you. But I'm here to reiterate in person what I'm saying. And I wanna be supportive of my friend, Teresa. We've been friends for a long time, about five decades. And I have been on her farm recently several times. I appreciate that she is really trying to create an environment of sustainability on the farm. She's doing a whole lot of really nice things there. Um, she's making, she's interested in planting crops for pollinators. She's interested in improving soil health and water quality. She's planting, I've seen her plant flowering bushes along the creek. She's making a scenic pathway. She's getting ready to install a stream exclusion system for, her, for some of the horses. And so I just request your support too for Terre Haute Farm to be sustainable and continue on in the spirit that it was it's been for hundreds of years. Thanks. Thank you. Not seeing anyone else. Mr. Smith, do we have anyone on Zoom? Zoom is clear, Mr. Chair. We will close the public comment period or public hearing. And board members, comments, suggestions, questions. I can make a motion. Yes, sir. Mr. McClung. Mr. 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 McClung, this is in my district. I'm making a motion. I was waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to speed it up. He was wondering if he was going to send some coffee over there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Could you all do it in a hurry? No. <laughs> Let's move it along. To do. Okay. I can do this in a hurry. I move to approve ordinance 0 202206. Second. Second. Comments, questions? 
Not hearing any. Mr. Smith, 2208, Mr. Mr. Williams. I think you, I meant 2208, Mr. Williams. Yeah, that's it. Okay, you said 06. Or no motion. Okay, thank you. Well, hold it, hold it. Hold it's E. Oh, I'm the sorry. Bottom. It's you're E. Right. You're, you're right. You're right. Thank you. <clears throat> Roll call. Roll call, Mr. Smith. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. Aye. Mr. Scott. Aye. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Byerly. Aye. Next up, case 020-09, <clears throat> it's case 2202-CUP. Mr. Hopkins. Frank. Yes, this is for an accessory uh, dwelling. Lot is owned R2. The house is 3,700 square feet. The accessory structure is about 1,200 square feet, 800 of which is a living space. So elderly parents will be visiting half the year. The rest of the time, it'll be an office. Um, got no complaints about it. I'll take questions and a public hearing in the interest of time. Is the applicant here? Yep. Long night for her. Yeah, very long <laughs> night. Getting tired. I understand. Um, it, this is, I am a local business owner. Um, I am partnered with both Mill, Lakeside. I do floral design. Um, I have a small business. Um, I run it out of my home. It's very difficult because um, I do do it year round. And in the winter months, it is pretty hard to run a large scale floral business um, out of your home. Um, but this is not going to be, there's no one coming and going. I don't even do meetings at my home. Um, it is mostly just for storage. And then there also is going to be space for um, my parents who live in Missouri, but they visit us. I am basically their caretaker and, or will be their full-time caretaker. Um, and I have a mother with Alzheimer's and a father who's um, got some disabilities. So that's pretty much, it's pretty basic. <laughs> and there are 13 other structures identical to this in Valley Springs neighborhood. Okay. So. Anything else you'd like to add? No. Any questions? No. no. Good. Thank you. We'll open up to the public hearing. Anyone from the public wishing to speak? Not seeing anyone, anyone on Zoom, Mr. Smither? Ms. Toll, can you unshare, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Zoom is clear. Chairman. We'll close the public hearing. Board. Yes, Mr. Williams. I can make a motion. Chairman, do I speak? You'll do. I'll second it. I make a motion to approve. <laughs> <laughs> to approve. It's already been seconded. 2022 dash 09. Okay. So the motion is to pass. 02022-09, case 22-02, the CUP. A second. Comments, questions, board? Roll call, Mr. Smiller. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. McClung. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Ms. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Byerly. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Motion passes 5-0. Yes, Ms. Carmack. Um, I would like to propose that we move these accessory dwellings to an administrative um, oversight. It's, we pretty much seem to rubber stamp them, and it just lay, adds a layer of, I think, unnecessary bureaucracy. Why don't we just give it to staff, and if it meets, checks the criteria? That's a zoning ordinance change. Correct. Okay, which yep. has to go to the planning commission. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It has a whole, pro has a whole yeah. process. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can't exactly. just say I do it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I would, I would can, recommend. Can we talk about this another night. Yes, absolutely. I wanted <laughs> to recommend we approach that. Absolutely. Okay. So there's a recommendation that we review that or send it to the planning commission to review. Correct. That we turn the accessory dwelling applications over to staff and just let them make the decision. But as Mr. Cox has say, stated, it's a zoning ordinance, so it has to go Correct. through the entire public hearing process, planning commission, all that, et cetera. If, if you vote on it tonight, you put it on the planning commission's plate. So technically, you could vote on it tonight to put it on the plate. It's, come on, Bill. It's, we're almost done. <laughs> I, <wanna laughs> it's, I do, it's, too. It's, Five we're minutes. All, we're already okay, I move that we add this to the planning commission's agenda. Second. 
Aye. Second. Aye. Okay. Aye. Motion carries five. Uh, let's put that on the planning commission's agenda, Mr. Hopkins. No more detours. Okay. Now to uh, case 22-03 CUP. Yep. This is a, um, sorry, Child Daycare Center, 1510 uh, Holly Hills Road. Uh, the applicant is asking for eight children. She currently sees five. Got no complaints on this case at all. And I got one phone call in support. Didn't even know the applicant, but was positive about it. Um, and from everything I've heard, uh, a good member of our community. So we need the child care. So that's something else. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, let me know. Is the applicant here? Would you like to make a comment? Okay. <laughs> Uh, um, we'll open the public hearing. Not seeing anyone, uh, Mr. Smith or anyone on Zoom. Zoom is clear. Close the public hearing. Board members. Mr. Chair, I can make a motion since it's in my district. <laughs> It'll be approved 0 2022 10 case number 22 03 CUP. You were a little late with that second, Mr. Williams. <laughs> okay. Um, any comments, questions, board members? Not hearing any roll call, but Mr. Smither. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. Aye. McClellan. Aye. Cox, Mr. Carmack. <laughs> Mr. Byerly. Aye. Well, slow on that, Mr. Byerly. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay. We made it through that. Good. We're going to open up our last and final public comment period for the evening. Um, any individual, feel free to come down and speak. You have three minutes. If you're representing a group, you have five minutes. Kenneth Hatcher, 3617 Trenholm Road. I'm the chairman of the honorable members of the board. Uh, the case that other night on the Belgrade solar power system, uh, Mr. Cox asked, asked a good question. Why before? Did we have uh, an advertised public hearing uh, and the county attorneys uh, didn't really give a, a definitive answer. Uh, I listened to the planning commission video and at the conclusion, toward the conclusion, when they had voted uh, that the applicant was not in compliance with the CUP uh, comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan, the chairman turned and asked the county attorney you know, what, what did they do now? And uh, he said, uh, it's not a legal question. You can go back and look at it. And uh, he said uh, something about four corners, you need uh, a decision that you need to make. And then uh, the next question was well, like, what do we do? Do we go ahead and uh, proceed with, you know, making a decision on it? And the county attorney's advice at that time was, uh, no, that would be illegal to do that. Um, and But tonight, it seemed to be a legal issue because the applicant came forward and was able to present the case there. And I just wonder, in the event that uh, it's voted down to the Planning Commission and it's voted down here at the Board of Supervisors, and the applicant appeals it, uh, he's going to go before a judge and he doesn't have a legal case. I mean, it seems somewhat confusion. Uh, all the terms that have, have presented. And, you know, there was many things that could have been presented tonight about uh, that solar farm that we didn't have a chance to. If you look at that future land use map, the protected area goes all the way to Collegeville Road. And it's in, in that. In June of 2004, there was a thunderstorm. And I think it rained about seven inches. In this area, the water went down through there and that's when the power tan dams were washed out. And the applicant said they were going to put the panels together as close as they could. It's going to make into an, basically an asphalted area. Uh, and then also the uh, resource there about historical uh, Dunlow Academy uh, and a comprehensive plan says it's supposed to be protected, you know, by a buff and so forth. And it's in basically in, in the site where the panels are. The other element was uh, it was revealed that the applicant went to citizens over the weekend before he went to the, the planning commission and he made adjustments and told them that he would move it back from the close to their house and he would move it back into the area. 
he changed the area from what was presented to the planning commission and what the public had a knowledge of knowing and whether it was determined whether he moved into the protected area had, had not been determined and so it, it seemed all you know not the way it should be as far as letters and citizens address things making changes to the project you know over the weekend and uh and i don't know whether the uh planning director had an opportunity to review that i mean it, it's just all improper it's totally improper uh, i just can't see at this point how it can possibly be turned down if you say it and that's what your job is is to see that the applicant is in compliance with a comprehensive plan that the night you said he was and so that's going back to the planning commission of coming to you I, I don't see you got but one vote and that is that is it, it's already been approved thank you thank you sir David Barron, 3492, Richards Run, District 3. Uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Carmack for correcting me about the VDOT standards. Thank you. Uh, and I do appreciate that. And as you said, you respect for the landowner. Okay. That's great. Everything we've seen here tonight, to a certain degree, has been respect for one landowner. As far as citizens of Power Tan County, I'm not picking you up in particular, uh, the three voting partners, so to speak, don't have much regard for the citizens of Power Tan County. We have to worry about redoing this thing for the one landowner, put forth all this, make sure everything's done right for him. When Mr. Cox asks for extension to possibly look at maybe helping people out. I know a couple of pennies ain't much. I mean, what the heck? Uh, we, you know, we can't take time to do that, but we got to take time for one landowner. And I heard representative for the landowner talk about, uh, you know, trying to survive. Let me tell you one thing. I, I welcome anybody in business to make money. I think it's great. But if that isn't a joke, that land has been used and used and used for timber. And I think that's great. That's his prerogative. But to turn around to the citizens of Powhatan County and not give them the same consideration, it's sad. You know, to say that you, well, that 1.4 million, we got it covered. We got it covered. It's for this. It's for that. It's for this. Well, you know something? There's a whole lot of waste can be found in this government up here. Just like we have to do at our own homes when times get tight or your own business. I've been in business 16 years. I haven't been 28 years with Mr as our chairman, but you have to tighten up your business. Well, seems like nobody wants to do that with the county, any government. I'm not just picking on y'all, federal, state, local. It's always all money falls from the heavens like manna, like did for the poor Israelites. Well, you know something, we ain't got so much manna to give. Yes, we want good schools. Yes, we want good everything. But if you tell me that it's not at least 10% waste in the county government and the schools. Y'all don't know, y'all have no idea what's going on in your county or anywhere else, any business, at least 10%. But we don't have the opportunity to worry about that because we got to rush through and stick to that tax rate. Could have very easily had a discussion with the public get involved, but nah, we don't want that. Well, the public does, but some members of this board don't. Thank you all. I'm sorry it's been a long night and I'm sorry it took up so much of your time. Thank you. Anyone on uh, Zoom, Mr. Schmidt? Zoom is clear, Mr. Chairman. We'll close the public comment period. County attorney comments? There are no comments, Mr. Chairman. Any administrator comments? No comments, Mr. Chairman. Board comments? No comments. Everybody wants to go home? <laughs> I got some comments. <clears throat> There's going to be a workshop, public workshop, Friday, April the 1st, 
it'll be like the fourth or fifth one that you can come and comment about the budget or anything that you want to talk about with the finance. It's been open. Every one of them is open to the public and there's two public comments for each one of them. So you're all welcome to come and we invite you to come and tell us what you'd like to see us do. Um, and then I have a uh, piece of transparent information. Amelia County's tax rates, 51 cents, Cumberland's 75 cents. We wanna look at the tax rate comparisons. That's Cumberland 75 and Amelia 51. And um, we have lowered the tax rate in this county. Both years we've been on the board. And uh, the last thing is, I don't think there's any employee being added to the county at um, up to $150,000 worth of income. Sure.